So live, we're live, we're live. Good morning, Living Soil Nerds. Happy Thursday to you. Uh, again, this is another one that I've uh, been trying to work on behind the scenes. Uh, let you guys know that the debates are coming. Uh, we're, we're setting some dates in. So uh, I think the community does see how slow some of this does actually take behind the scenes. So we appreciate each and every uh, one of you that wants to be a part of this and kind of just going back and understanding things and then reevaluating things. And that's kind of what this show is today. Uh, I was lucky enough to have uh, breakfast with Bart probably a couple months ago. Uh, we were chopping it up about a variety of topics. And one of the things that he dropped on the, on me was uh, his, his thoughts on biochar. And, and really when it comes to like, you know, thinking long term uh, biochar ideas and protocols and that kind of stuff. Um, and again, I just when when people really are deep thinkers, I, I hope to uh, bring them on the show. And again, that's why uh, Bart's on the show today is because. Every time that I talk with this gentleman, hang out with this gentleman, um, we have deeper conversations than just kind of the norm. So, uh, Bart, I appreciate you coming on here. I'll let uh, my co-host Layton kind of chop it up a little bit. Always thank you to Peter and, and to Chad for, you know, the IT stuff behind the scenes is it, not enough people uh, appreciate that. So we, we just like the fact that we're always looking good, Peter, and we thank you for that. Uh, Layton, if, if you had anything to say, and then uh, I was excited to chop it up and really go deeper into biochar, especially when we're talking long term. Yeah, that sounds great. And uh, yes, Peter, we don't give you enough credit for all the work that you're doing behind the scenes to make this happen and the dedication and time that you put into this. Um, so deep respect, deep love and appreciation, Peter, for all you do. Um, yeah, Brian, you finally got your fucking way, dude. We're, we're going to chop up carbon today. <laughs> <laughs> you motherfucker. So, yeah, this is going to be a really good one. Um, I think that it's a conversation that needs to be had um, at a deeper level, um, because what is the difference between biochar and compost? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, without further ado, Bert, Bart, you wanted to uh, chime in here and set the stage for uh, where you want to take this conversation today. Yeah, thanks, Leighton. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Brian. Um, this is a, an invert interesting let's say an interesting topic for me because um you know biochar does get a lot of uh of good press uh it's been a real popular um soil amendment in the last five to ten years there are a lot of people making soil mixes based on biochar um, it's probably one of the top questions we get asked at certain shows uh, is our opinion on biochar and why we don't run it in our soil mixes and uh you know, before I get into some of the negatives, uh, I'd like to start out with some of the things that are positive about biochar. If I'm consulting on a on a farm field that has been heavily nitrated and therefore most of the organic matter is burned out of it, um, I think biochar can be a really cost effective amendment to get some carbon and some organic matter back into the soil. Uh, it uh, it is relatively inexpensive and anytime i see soil organic matter under you know one or two percent something like that and the people don't have a big budget um, i think biochar is a great place to start uh, the thing that we kind of have to remember about biochar is while it can provide a good home for um, several species of microbes it uh, really is is not in its own right an amendment or an inoculant or sorry an inoculant of any sort typically after coming out of a hot fire you know it's pretty sterile so when you use biochar you have to get your soil biology from somewhere so i find biochar and compost um, in conjunction or biochar and compost tea can be a good combination to try to drive that kind of uh uh re rehoming in the biochar itself um and so uh you know there there's also a lot about biochar and carbon sequestration and um, i feel like biochar could be a really good um, way to do some longer term carbon sequestration uh it's going to take more research and, and it's really interesting if you look into biochar research you can find conflicting research on both sides of the the issue really in almost every part of ways biochar can be both beneficial or can be detrimental um 
so with that being said, the thing that I've noticed once we start trying to use biochar and mixes like our potting mixes, which are, you know, over 50% organic matter, uh, is that we don't see an overall gain in species diversity, but we do typically see gains in certain species of bacterial organisms. And so, um, you know, that's that that's what was interesting to me. And and when I'm looking at adding anything to our mixes, um, we always do a lot of research. And there's a lot of time behind the scope. And there's a lot of um, trials that need to happen. And we need to see a positive benefit. And so, that's what I haven't been able to show is that in a high organic matter, uh, let's call it a somewhere between a soil and a soilless media, um, especially one with compost and a, a high microbial species diversity, we end up actually typically seeing a decrease in growth and plant health and things like that. Now, it gets tricky because not all biochar is made the same. And we've gotten several different kinds of biochar from several different vendors with wildly varying results. And um, you know, to me, the, the biochar we see that performs the best is biochar that's made in an extremely hot environment, at least above 700 degrees, and um, with uh, a very good vacuum, close to vacuum pyrolysis situation where you can really get those carbaceous oils and where people are leaving it at those high temperature and lack of oxygen for over 12 hours, up to 24 hours in some cases that tends to, in my opinion, produce the best biochar. Um, certain biochars that they either have more oxygen introduced into the environment or they have um, uh, a lower temperature, I find some of those actually are quite toxic and you get certain toxins as part of that chemical process. And that's what we have to remember, you know, the thermodynamic process that it takes to create biochar is a chemical reaction. This isn't a natural product anymore. We've made new chemicals out of it. They might well be beneficial in some ways to to certain microbes, but nonetheless, um, in its own right, it's not quite a natural product. So I guess those are my main points, and maybe I'll turn it back over to you all to, to touch on some of that. Well, I kind of wanted to qualify you, Bart, because some of the individuals that um, <clears throat> claim to make soil and stuff uh, behind the scenes, and uh, I'm not going to, you know, throw anybody out of, under the bus. I just want the community to know this, that a lot of that stuff is actually being done third party. And then those individuals are, um, you know, putting their name on it, their brand on it and selling it that way. You actually have a team of individuals that are constantly making truckloads of this stuff. Uh, so I, I just wanted uh, our newer viewers that are newer to you, Bart, and, and what you guys are doing uh, to know the volume of, of of the soil that you're making because you're going to obviously see a lot more things coming back good and bad with just the amount of volume of stuff that you produce each and every year you know i am clarify he doesn't make biochar he doesn't make biochar i'm sorry he's making soil and he's making soil at such a large volume that he gets so much feedback coming back on a variety of different amendments we were just having a casual fun conversation at breakfast and he was blowing my mind with some of the stuff that he was talking about when you when you really when you're really building a soil system and thinking things through three years, five years, seven years, 10 years down the road. Uh, what is some of the information that's coming back? And Bart is uh, with some of uh, like probably a handful of individuals that I know that are at that level and also at the commercial aspect. So where they can the volume size is there for for the data for me to actually uh, me want to go down the rabbit hole with. Uh, so I just wanted to qualify that, and I probably didn't do that uh, very well at all. But um, Bart makes soil, and Bart makes uh, soil that I, I find to be highly beneficial to what most farmers are after. All right, so let's 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 reel it back in a little bit. Um, so Bart, in your experience, you you uh, have lots of test data. What have the long term results been on? when you've introduced biochar into a soil system and then heard back or had feedback from that client one, two, three, five years later. And do you have any data that you could share with the audience? Yeah. Um, I mean, so once again, it's, it's 
two factors, I feel like. It's the quality of the biochar, which a lot of the stuff on the market, frankly, is kind of sus. So, you know, uh, any pretty much at this point, anyone who dumps some logs in a fire pit and covers it with some dirt with their backhoe claims they're making biochar. Um, and, and then you've got people all the way to the other end of the spectrum who have advanced systems that are capable of, of heating uh, the char to, you know, over a thousand degrees and have this stuff in a, a completely vacuum sealed chamber for, for up to 24 hours. So there's a kind of a vast difference in how it gets made. And, and as much as I probably wouldn't have originally thought that I do see the difference in the toxicity of the finished product on the microbial life. And, you know, um, one, one, type of life form invertebrates, worms that people get really into. Um, in particular, like time and time again, I see worms not really very happy with biochar. Uh, but in general, like where, where I see people do well is if we're consulting on field scale and, um, you know, there's, there's this thing with nitrate salts and it was Dr. Kristen Nichols that really clued me into the whole thing where like, uh, let's say you're feeding nitrate salts on a hay field, you know, you got a thousand acres and um, the salt companies know that you have to have twice as much of the nitrate salt as you actually can, can use to get the delivery to the plant at the level that they want to see. It's kind of one of the built in nasties of the salt nitrate fertilizer industry. Uh, and then your plant uses it, you grow your crop, it's great. And it, it's a system that works, obviously. But that whole rest of the season after you harvest, that nitrate salt is in the soil. And the soil microbes are going to win. Like, they're really amazing. And so what happens is you end up burning a lot of your carbon organic matter out because your soil microbes are like, hey, we've got all this excess nitrogen. What are we going to do? We're going to use carbon to process that. That's the whole carbon to nitrogen ratio and composting. And those two elements are the key elements for most of the microbial life in the soil. So when you've got too much nitrogen in the soil on a chronic reoccurring basis, and this is where like red tides come from and things like that, or all these nitrates washing out, really you've created an engine to burn the organic matter out of your soil. And it's, it's a chronic problem in this country. It's kind of what in a way was part partially responsible for the dust bowl. And I think we're, headed in a direction again where we're where we're not appreciating the organic matter in our soil and as we've talked about before on this show the organic matter is all of your water holding capability of your soil if you can take a soil from one percent organic matter to two percent organic matter um, you're going to have a 300 percent increase in the water holding capability of the soil so when i come to one of these dead fields where they're saying hey you know we we can't get this field really to grow very well. It doesn't matter how much nitrates we dump on it. The water hits it. It's clay. It just runs off. We test it. We see that kind of uh, uh, low, low organic matter. Biochar can be actually quite helpful in that situation, and especially a, a well-made biochar. You can come into essentially dead, lifeless, not water-holding soil, and you can with, you know, probably, let's call it, two to three hundred dollars an acre um, really add something that's going to give you that instant boost if you add the microbes with it. it it does give the microbes a place to live it does provide some carbon and some organic matter to the soil almost instantly and fortunately like i think one of its greatest strengths is that that carbon is highly stable it's going to stay there for a long long time and in a world with climate change okay that's that's a benefit now, if you flip to the other side of the spectrum and you take these soils that are, you know, these living organic mixes um, where we have 50 percent organic matter time and time again, at least when I when I look through the scope and this is hundreds of times, I reduce species diversity of my fungal organisms in particular, as well as microarthropods, invertebrates, um, all of those species that that diversity goes down fairly radically with most types of biochar that i've tested in my lab and in my growth trials 
And so that species diversity is really, for me, the engine that kind of makes what we do different. We, we typically have a minimum of 20,000 species, sometimes as high as 40,000 species. And so, um, you know, to, to then add something that's going to kill, you know, some percentage, 40% of those species, even if your overall total bacteria goes up. And bacteria loves biochar. And there's a bunch of fascinating research by Ingham and the like on like, um, uh, I don't think it's salmonella, it's another uh, bad pathogen. But you can see that biochar can be effective in um, uh, catching it, holding it, uh, and then even culturing out beneficial species of bacteria that can have uh, a beneficial effect against those pathogens, those anaerobic pathogens. So that's that's the situation where I feel like biochar really shines is in a, a field that's been over nitrated and has low organic matter. It can be cost effective when used in conjunction with compost or some other good inoculant to try to put something in the biochar. But just putting biochar in a field or a mix isn't going to do anything and uh or not much like really very little unless you give it that microbial engine to work with and then in the potting mixes our growth trials show a decrease every every time um, when we're running like one of our full full strength kind of in between super soil and living organic soil we kind of ride that line and so we're at about 50 percent organic matter and almost every time our overall yields, our overall plant health actually go down a little bit when, and it's not a huge detractor unless it's a really poor quality char. And then it is, it's a radical decrease in performance. Um, but with a good, good biochar, it's either, you know, slightly negligible to decent negative in several performance metrics. And define for our audience, in your opinion, what is quality biochar? And, and just, maybe, yeah, it just needs to be completely made in a completely oxygen-free environment, in my opinion. And you know, I'm not a biochar expert. That's the first thing I want to say. Like, I I deal with probably 30 different ingredients, and I have to become an expert in those. And um, when one doesn't show me some significant benefit, I kind of am like, okay, well, you know, I know I'm going to use this on a field that is dead and needs some organic matter and they've got a really low budget. That's going to be where I'm going to, I'm going to say, yeah, let's do biochar for sure. But otherwise I kind of have decided that I can't get the benefit I want out of it. But the main thing that I see the the chars that I see that perform the best and, and there's a whole new world of like hydrochar and like using hot water to extract the carbaceous oils and things like that. So it seems like there are definitely some potential advancements to the science of biochar on the horizon. But um, for me, in living organic potting mixes, it just decreases species diversity. And it's a thing I kind of, you know, battle with folks on even even all the Windrow Turner compost guys. Um, I I disagree that that's the right way to do it because once again, you're kind of killing all your spores, killing all your mycelium, they're delicate. Um, and to me, the fungal organisms are the, the most important part of the soil food web and obviously not without bacteria and like a SCOBY or something, you have all these symbiotic relationships between these organisms. But once again, I'll go to Dr. Kristen Nichols. She has a really cool chart that shows the amount of interaction between species in the soil food web and um, fungal are at the top as far as the number of interactions and the number number of reactions that they can make happen in the soil bacteria is next um, you know but if you kind of have a product like biochar that i feel like in higher quantities kills one of those main groups of organisms that um, uh, is important to the whole functioning of the soil food web in a healthy manner that's not what i'm looking for and so um you know it's it's tricky but yeah to answer your original question hot and no oxygen 
and a, a long period, at least 24 hours. And that's expensive. I mean, admittedly, the machine to do that's expensive. The fuel to do that's expensive. And that's the whole trick with biochar, even on a climate level is, you know, if you can make its thermal energy be the reaction that's making more of it, okay, great, that's a relatively innocuous thing. But if you're having to burn a bunch of fossil fuel to do this reaction, which most bioproducers, biochar producers are, now even the carbon sequestration is coming into question whether we're really getting a big benefit out of it or not. So I guess in a nutshell, those are kind of some of the nuances that I've discovered in the biochar world. Um, when it when it comes to the actual like look of it, um, some people believe that it has like a glass sheen to it. You kind of drop it, it has more of a thud to it. Is there any validity to that or is that just different ways that people can make biochar? Quite probably, you know, once again, without being a biochar expert, that that's all I do is study biochar. Um, I can't give you empirical evidence about studies I've done on the textures of biochar, but I do feel like the hotter it gets and the less oxygen it gets, the more you get this carbaceous oil. And then, you know, at those temperatures, those oils do interesting things. And so I certainly have some that have that glass sheen. And I do feel sometimes um, maybe that's an indicator that the biochar producer did a better job of keeping oxygen out of the environment or took their time and left it in that pyrolysis state for a long period of time. Um, but it would be interesting. And, and that's the interesting thing about biochar is it's relatively in its infancy. And, um, you know, I mean, people have used it for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years in some way or another, you know, the first people who who uh, covered their fire pit and and let it go out in a low oxygen environment were the originators of biochar. But as far as a, a soil amendment for organic producers in living soil systems, it's a relatively new thing. And that's where I feel like we can be a little more nuanced in looking at, okay, biochar does well in this situation, it doesn't do well in this situation, or this type of biochar can be beneficial, but this type of biochar is highly toxic. And certainly some of the, some of the types of biochar I've tested are, seem to be toxic to most soil microbe species. Once again, you know, bacteria seem to be the survivors. Like you can run the windrow th turner through the bacteria, they don't care. You can burn some of them, they don't care. The thermophiles can go up to 150 degrees, they don't care. So, um, you know, it, it really is about your environment, your media. Do you have enough organic matter? Do you have a good compost already? Uh, if you have this species diversity already, then biochar probably isn't going to be much of a help to you. On the other hand, if you don't have some of that stuff, then biochar, a good biochar probably could be of help to you. So, you know, I'd love to just chime in for a second here because you hit on a lot of different points that probably need to be expanded. Um, so, yeah, in the process of cooking this stuff down, it does it does get crispy and therefore sharp. And that's uh, in many ways problematic to the orthopods and the worms, which you've clearly seen, Bart. Um, it's a sim similar as like putting diatomaceous earth um, as an insecticide. It, it, it cuts the bugs up. So... Um, in that regard, I can see how it would knock back the more advanced organisms in the food web, um, which is definitely negative. And, you know, that other piece of, of understanding the carbon footprint or impact on making it has always been my biggest bitch. I mean, if you're harvesting it from a wildfire, first of all, you're not going to get that temperature. Or if you do, you're not going to get it in an oxygen free environment. That's for shit sure. Um, and you are going to get the benefit of the coal or the carbon like you can rub it off you can you can mark yourself with it so th those are soft carbon forms um that can be easily consumed by biology so in a in a situation like that where a fire has come through and naturally made the biochar i see benefit to it um but producing you know this this product in a kiln um, requiring a tremendous amount of energy and ending up with a glassy structure that is potentially detrimental to the higher and more advanced 
organisms in the soil food web, again, is a negative. And Bart, I agree with you 100 percent as far as like restoring uh, dead soil and, and the fact that you hit on that key piece that in the breakdown of nitrogen ammonia, you're going to either need water in an ammoniacal form uh, or in a breaking down an ammoniacal form of nitrogen and or you're going to need a carbon source to break down uh, a nitrate. Um, so, yeah, you're you're going backwards in in building um, organic matter in any soil when you're using a salt based nitrate um, or you're burning a tremendous amount of water up if you're using an ammoniacal form. So there's a lot to, you know, better understanding how to support a soil food web living field as far as, you know, what's the best amendment to bring that back to life as fast as you can. And I've always found that liquid carbons are, are the key to it. So a liquid carbon is basically taking compost and making an extract out of it. So beating the top, beating the daylights out of it. Um, and putting all of those fine little particulates of carbon into suspension in water in an aqueous environment, and then applying that in in on the fields in a in a spray, and what that does is it penetrates down. Whereas you top dress with with a uh, compost or or a biochar, you're top dressing, so you're only impacting the very top part of the soil. Whereas when you're making a, a, a liquid form of carbon you're now penetrating down many inches into that soil profile and therefore providing a lot more benefit to um, the overall microbial community. And yet something else that was you hit that was really, really interesting that needs to be expanded is now the understanding of the relationship of fungi to bacteria in a soil system. Um, it's clear that the fungi don't change. So every season, every week, every month, every different type of weather impact changes the bacterial communities tremendously, um, but it does not affect the fungi. So therefore, the fungi really are the architects or the king of the soil. Um, and if you're adversely affecting them by using a component like biochar, you're definitely going in the wrong direction because those are the ones that we need to protect. Fungi are the first to go in a disturbed soil, the first to go in a, in a soil that's been exposed to any type of synthetic, whether it's fertilizer or pesticide. So if, if we're going to talk about building soil structure, increasing organic matter, increasing diversity in soil microbes, fungi are king. Fungi are the, the internet, the, the pathways that allow that bacteria to travel back and forth uh, through a tremendous amount of area, just based on riding the wave um, of the the coating on the outside, and in some cases the inside of the of the fungi. So, if if biochar is detrimental to fungi, now in a dead field, I understand it, it has value. But if you have a living system and you're applying that, then you're probably stepping back, not stepping forward. And that's that's my two cents on it for now. I agree, hundred percent. Well, and that's what's funny about this is because, you know, just a few years ago, it was the exact opposite. Uh, everybody out there, at least the community as a whole, was believing that biochar created diversity. So as long as you didn't put too much on there, uh, things would continue to improve. Then when you talk to some of these commercial living soil uh, natural farmers, they say that as the years have progressed, some of them are experiencing hard to keep up with fungal aspects. So that's why when I was having breakfast with you, Bart, it was kind of an aha moment for me, uh, at least to go down the rabbit hole more with this biochar stuff, because, you know, for a long, long time, there was so much almost like gospel with stuff on this is how things are done, uh, especially in the forum days, some of maybe the earlier soil mixes days. Uh, and now we see that as long as we keep things a little bit simple, we manage the systems. Um, there's just a lot more. Uh, that can be achieved by us getting out of the way. And biochar seems to be another thing that we have to take a, a deeper, closer look at. I agree. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting. And that's the beauty of science, in my opinion, is that science really doesn't care about the hype. Um, and, you know, we have a choice as growers, whether we want to um, stick with the hype or, or go with the science and at this point, you know, 
it's it, there there's getting to be more and more science on biochar and some of these negative aspects are certainly coming out on the other hand i don't want to disparage a product that i feel like does have a benefit and we're all trying to you know grow the best crops make people the most self-sufficient and heal the planet and i think those are um you know places where there is a place for biochar if it's used judiciously and in the right right way but yeah it it'll be really interesting to see what what more and more of the um, mainstream science studying biochar comes up with in the next few years i agree 100 percent, man and, and you know the i noticed in the chat they're talking about you know yeah biochar is sterile all right it is completely sterile when it's completed you have to inoculate it to get it to be of any value and if you inoculate it you're only inoculating it with a very few species of bacteria um from what i understand and i had a friend that did a uh, accidental experiment where um, he took worm castings and exposed it to biochar and put it in a bag and left it in his garage and forgot about it and went back a year later <clears throat> and it was inoculated with worm castings, a fungally dominant worm casting. So it should have been a tremendous amount of fungi and there wasn't. There was just a tremendous amount of bacteria. So again, the, the benefits of biochar are limited, at least in, in my opinion, as far as what they can actually provide. Yes, in a field that's dead, it does have value because it is putting some kind of organic matter back in play at a cost-effective manner. Um, but if you didn't inoculate it, then now you're letting your existing bacteria colonize it. Um, where, where did you gain a, a large benefit other than you're starting to build biofilm and aggregates? But again, without fungi, you're not gonna get there very quick. That's again my two cents on. Here, here, go team fungi. Um, so uh, there was a question on, on Bart. I know this isn't like your expertise, but um, they, kind of if you could define what the difference between charcoal and biochar is. Because like if somebody's going to the store and they see two on the shelf, like what's what's the difference there? Well, it seems to me like it. There isn't really an official difference. I mean, when you look up certain studies on biochar, they talk about it as charcoal. Um, now commercial charcoal made for burning in your grill, obviously comes out looking different than a lot of the glassy type biochars we see. And so to me, what I would presume is that they're not taking the time and the energy consumption to um, keep that pyrolysis going for a long period of time, you know, the oxygen free environment, uh, and that they're probably using a lower temperature to make most charcoals. And like Layton was saying, you know, the char from the forest, that's kind of what you're seeing there is, is this uh, burnt wood that um, didn't burn in a completely oxygen-free environment. In a forest fire, a lot of the oxygen gets used up, but you've got all the oxygen of the planet to replenish it. So it's never going to completely be oxygen-free. Whereas if you take a stainless steel drum, put all your char in there, pump all the air out of it with a vacuum pump, and then hit it with heat, now you're making a whole different thing. And, and really, you get a lot more of the carbaceous oils in that environment, and they, they stay in the wood itself. The more oxygen you've got, the more those carbaceous oils can combust once they have an oxygen to do that with. And... Um, so, uh, you know, they, they burn off and, and are lost to the environment. So really, yeah, it's, to me, it's, it's that lack of oxygen seems to be the biggest thing. And then temperature is the second biggest factor. And Brian, uh, you know, another two cents on that is that look at the difference between coal that's used to generate electricity and lenadite, which is brown coal. Now, they're basically both organic matter that has been pressed in an oxygen free environment for thousands if not millions of years but the black coal burns and if you look at it it has a sheen to it it has what we call um in rocks we talk about cleavage so flint is has wonderful cleavage when you chip it it becomes very very sharp and the same is true with black coal when you when you snap it with a hammer you're going to get these concave convexed 
uh, shiny surfaces that can be sharp, um, you really have to work to cut yourself, unlike flint. But that is that is the end result of a long term um, high pressure, high heat environment where you on the other side of that scale, you have this brown coal, which you can crush up, has no cleavage, has nothing shiny. But lenadite is the foundation of humic acid. And we all know the benefits of humic acid, and especially if it's the right kind of brown coal or lenadite. And there are many, many different forms of lenadite. They're not all created equally. Um, and they're all different. Uh, they're all created from different environments of different types of plants and animals that were crushed. So there's a lot more to this than than we can ever really get down that rabbit hole today. And that's why in the beginning I said to you, you motherfucker, Brian, here we go. <laughs> fucking carbon. One of the most complex things on this planet. Oh, hey, you're, you're blaming the messenger. You know, I, I reach out to the <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what, And they love where like, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a whole nother side to what Bart is saying. I just love having different opinions uh, talk about things that, that that is missing in, in some of this cannabis culture as we're moving forward. We should be allowed to have uh, disagreements um, and, and continue to work through this so that the science tells us, um, you know, how to keep moving forward. And the fact that you're constantly testing, Bart, it's going to be pretty hard uh, for individuals to, you know, at least not respect that and maybe go down that same rabbit hole to research it for themselves. That's it. And that's what I kind of implore people to do is, take the biochars you can get and take a good living organic soil and, you know, add them in certain ratios and scope it yourself. Like there's nothing, nothing that substitutes. And we've got great microscopes these days. We've got great video microscopes that work with our computers and our phones, um, you know, that can see down to bacterial scale. So, um, do this research yourself. It doesn't take a giant lab. It's stuff that you can do. You can go in and at least say, oh, well, there's a lot more um, bacteria today and there's a lot less uh, hyphae expanding through this slide that I'm looking at. And, and you can see what you did and why that works. And I guess one other actual aspect that was a big downer for me in biochar, being in the arid Southwest, a lot of my local input materials are already alkaline to begin with. A lot of my clients are already dealing with uh, alkali in their water and in their soil. And biochar, in my experience, tends to be yet again alkalizing. And so um, I think it has some big advantages. And you can see this in the, in the uh, uh, university research around biochar is that it can be very helpful in an acidic environment. But in the desert southwest or um, arid regions, it's just another hurdle that you kind of have to overcome if you're going to use it. And so uh, once again, that really points to using it, at least in alkaline environments, in a very small amount and then trying to do other things to get the rest of what you need. And, you know, uh, I... Leighton, I agree completely with your your liquid carbon stuff, teas. I'm really into them. Um, I'm also a big believer in compost to a certain level. Uh, but what I find is that people over compost and then they over potassium. And that's probably the number one thing I see on organic farms in Colorado that I consult for is that these farms that have been trying to just use compost as the source of their fertility and organic matter for several years are almost all potassium toxic. Um, and so we kind of need different ways of looking at how we're going to get this carbon back into the soil, um, how we're going to get raise the organic matter, and how we're going to do it without making the soils toxic in some other way. And that's the, the cool thing about soil um, biology and soil science is that it's really a bottomless rabbit hole. There are so many interactions between so many different species and so many different natural elements that um, it's one of the most complex uh, systems that you can really try to understand. And it's, it's what I love about it. It's what makes it fun for me and, and allows me to just keep learning, which stimulates me over the years, is that you can change this little piece and all of a sudden it changes 50 other pieces. Um, but for me, I'm kind of honing in on 
we're 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 gonna have our 10 year anniversary this fall um as a company and so um i feel like finally we're really honing in on some some stuff that's very solid and we've had a good solid five years of really not changing our mixes and um if we do making it a very slow little little tweaks to to change things and um you know does biochar have a place in the world yeah i think it does does it have a place in a potting mix and it's it's the same kind of thing you know some people will get on my case oh what you're making is a soilless media well wait a minute but it's got compost in it it's got all the same minerals in it that you'd find in the rainforest floor so is it a soil is it an engineered you know a lot of our a lot of our terms that we've come up with don't fit where we've gotten to as scientists and as growers and as biologists we're kind of in a brave new world where we're having to to define these categories of things, including media, including um, amendments, uh, and and so on. So it's a fascinating time, and I'm, if anything, just a proponent of science. Hey, Bart, can I just ask a quick question? When you mention people who are making their compost, people who are making their compost, and then it kind of is hot, is too hot, or is there adding external amendments like langbanite, langbanite to their compost need potassium and they just do too much? Or is that because their compost itself is high in potassium? Like, why is, why, why are they high in potassium? Well, it's a great question. And, um, what I kind of determine, like when I look at most composts, I would say that an average of them is maybe a one, two, three NPK or there's about, obviously, if we have an all um, plant based compost, you're going to have less nitrogen. Typically, uh, if you're going to have a plant based compost with higher nitrogen, something like alfalfa meal or a bean meal or something like that, something with a lot of protein in it is the only way you're going to get there. And even an alfalfa meal is like, a 2.50, 2.5. So you can see that, um, you know, nitrogen is the most consumed macronutrient, but uh, we're, we're kind of aiming in the opposite direction. So, um, and, and it, it did confuse me because I've really got this philosophy that nature gets it right. And that if you study the rainforest floor, that's the soil that we're trying to emulate making. And, um, and so it didn't make sense to me. Why would compost this product? I love that I feel is so beneficial in so many ways, be out of ratio to Albrecht ratios or something like that. And in the end, what I decided is that I think it comes from like primitive agriculture or even in the rainforest, you know, it's not like there aren't any animals there. And when those animals die and fall down on the rainforest floor and become part of the system, they're almost pure nitrogen. And so when we have these manure composts, we kind of forget that there was an animal that made this manure and that that animal's body and carcass is almost 100 percent nitrogen. And it's a really high quality amino based nitrogen. Um, it's not a nitrate. And when you add all that kind of animal waste, carcass waste back into the system, the animals that made those manures, now it all balances out. Now you've got the amount of good amino nitrogen that the plant can once again decide, do I want to consume this nitrogen or not? And, um, and typically most of us, when we buy a compost, we're not buying a bag of bone meal or blood meal or feather meal along with it. We're just buying the compost and putting it out. And, um, you know, it's, it's one thing if we have our soil biology to a point where we're not amending, but most of us are amending, like that's just kind of how it is. And the better we get at um, building our soil, we can get to a point where we barely have to amend. But I think it's really important. If we're going to add compost. We need to add a pure amino nitrogen along with it to get it back into balance. And unfortunately, a lot of plants have as much potassium as if not more nitrogen in them. So it's a little trick with uh, making a plant-based compost to not have it go in the potassium toxicity. You know, it, it's, it's ironic because other parts of the country, we have other issues with uh, lack of potassium. 
So again, I think it goes back to where are you and what are your plants uptaking and what is your what is the environment in which those plants are living? And and so, yeah, I can see how you have issues with toxic toxicity with with potassium, where on the East Coast, uh, it's more like calcium. We have we have excess calcium in in the, in the compost. So, again, I, the, every compost is not created equal. And what the fuck is the word compost? Compost is a process. It's not a definition of of the end result of composting. So that's that's a whole nother rabbit hole that that really is becoming mainstream now is is all right. Let's let's take the word compost and understand that it's a process. Well, what are the results of it? And so the recent uh, understanding on the scientific community is that you have what's called POM, which is particulate organic matter on one end of the scale. Prior to that, we call it GOM, ground up organic matter. So just you taking all these different plants and grinding them, tub grinding them, shredding them, whatever. Um, that's the foundation or the beginning of the composting process. And on the other end of the scale is called MOM. So that's mineral associated organic matter. So POM is readily available, will be burned up by microbes within a few months of, of application, where MOM takes potentially years for it to break down. So think of silt. And, and MOM is like the level just before silt um, as far as what is the decomposition process from tree to soil input uh, silt. So there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. You know, let's, let's wrap it back up a little bit and say, hey, does nature make compost? Does nature make biochar? And I had that argument with, with people years ago, uh, James Satillo, he was like, oh, nature doesn't make compost. I'm like, well, you ever been along a river and seen floatsome piles of, of trees and brush and leaves sticking out all over the place? That's fucking compost. Exactly. You, you ever gone to a, a forest and gone to the other side of a blowdown or, or stone wall where all the leaves have piled up? That's fucking composting. That's so. It. And so nature composts and nature makes biochar. Coal is biochar. <laughs> Lanidite is biochar. Uh, the, the ashes and, and the, the coal that's left behind after a forest fire, that's biochar. So th this is like a, like you said, uh, Bart, this is a deep fucking rabbit hole that goes back to carbon. What the fuck is carbon? So, um, to answer your question, Peter, yeah, if, if you're if you're composting plant based only or if you're adding mineral or adding uh, manures, you got a whole other situation. You've got heavy metals because the animal can't digest those minerals in its food. So it's concentrating them and pooping them out similar to issues with hash, you know, especially if it's been exposed to any kind of pesticide. You're just building those pesticides up as you con uh, condense um your cannabis down so you know those things are all coming into play in these you know very very complex bio geochemical reactions that are occurring all around us at all times so it's it's a conversation that's, that's fucking deep as hell for sure can you can you balance these ratios out knowing that this this happens long term uh at least with maybe like uh cold manures and that kind of stuff or uh, well, again, you again, Brian, you have to look at it like, all right, what are your inputs? And you heard me preach over and over and over again, diversity, diversity, diversity. Like I don't just take leaves or just take sticks or, or chips when I'm mixing browns together. I'm, I'm looking for as many different things as I possibly can because every plant is going to pull different things. Like we talk about, and they're not weeds. They're indicator plants. They're pulling out certain nutrients out of the sand, silt, and clay that they're living in bringing them up to the surface so that they can die and sacrifice for the next level of successionary plants to take hold. So what are you doing? And, and this goes back to being using common sense and being intellectual about your approach to making compost. And if you're making compost out of very potassium rich plants, yeah, you're going to fucking condense it down and make a very potassium rich compost at the end. So Again, look, at, know your shit, know your plants, know what they are, what they're what they're indicating um, the soil lacks in. And, and then now you understand what's going to be concentrated in that plant. 
So it's 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 using your using your fucking common sense and your knowledge. Exactly. And it's so easy in composting. That's that's the thing about nitrogen is it has a form, you know, as ammonia where it becomes a gas. And it's the strategy that the um, microbes have used when they have an abundance of nitrogen is to volatilize it and send it out as ammonia gas. And it goes into the vir environment and disappears out of your compost. And potassium doesn't have a form like that. Phosphorus doesn't have a form like that. Calcium doesn't have a form like that. So um, that's the thing we have to remember about nitrogen is, um, you know, it can be a gas and it microbes can turn it into a gas. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, if you don't have your carbon to nitrogen ratio right in your compost, all your nitrogen will just whoop volatilize. And it's why chicken litter smells so ammonia-y is because those microbes are like, okay, we don't have enough carbon. Well, we're going to turn that into a gas and it's going to be gone. And so <laughs> that's it. Yeah, it's... Uh, that's it's Friday a, for people that don't know that. Boom. So it's it's a really interesting... I'm using myself. Yay. Do it. People are and, talking about know, knowing where your shit comes from. And, and you know, something else that, that has not been really... Uh, studied to this point, and this is something that uh, Steiner brought up years ago, and that is the relationship to calcium and nitrogen. So, in my experience, this work, this project I was doing with GOM, which is ground up organic matter, green waste, um, they had this exact problem is that, man, when you go to that yard, all you smell is ammonia. And the state of California measures ammonia, and, and there's a level at which you can't exceed. And if you're exceeding that, you're releasing this, you know, you're, you're increasing greenhouse gases and you get fine. So these green waste facilities are like, well, now what do we do? Um, we've got to slow down this thermophilic phase where these thermophytes are just gobbling up as much carbon as they can to, to volatile, volatize that nitrogen into an ammoniacal gas to get rid of it so that they can continue to break down the carbon. And what's worse is at the bottom of those piles where you have very low oxygen and a tremendous amount of built up moisture. Now you're fucking an anaerobic digester. You're, you're actually producing methane gas. So when they turn these rows, it, it, your fucking eyes are watering and your breath is taken away between the combination of ammonia and methane. So yeah, it's crazy. All the other chemicals that um, soil, particularly anaerobic soil microbes can generate. I mean, I've seen, cases where guys go in a manure pit at a feedlot and never come back out because there was a heavier than air gas present in that pit and they die. And um, I've seen lab reports of anaerobic compost that has toluene and xylene in it made by those soil microbes and then broken down again. That's the crazy thing is the microbes can make it, they can break it. There are very few chemicals they can't. And as you mentioned before, Leighton, things like um, certain very toxic pesticides and persistent herbicides are some of those few chemicals that, uh, that compost microbes can't break down. But in most compost piles, they can make it, they can break it, and they can make extremely toxic substances in a low oxygen environment. And just to, just to touch on that, too, is that um, in some recent work I've done with a university back on the East Coast, they were actually proved that they could break down. Um, what the fuck is that pesticide? Uh, shit, it'll come to me. But it's one of those legacy pesticides that has so far been um, really hard to break down and has built up. DDT but, or um, something, probably. The DEET. Uh, as uh, DEET or no, um, azine. Oh, come on, atrazine. 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 So atrazine was shown to be able to be broken down to a secondary metabolite by white rot fungi, but that secondary metabolite is just as bad as the first metabolite. So they, they shifted it, they, they softened it, but they didn't get rid of it. So when they added the product that I made that's loaded with decomposers amongst everything else, um, there was no level, no trace levels of the secondary metabolites. So we know that a really healthy... Uh, soil food web based compost or biocomplete compost in combination with a highly fungally dominant. Um, yeah, that's the fucking shit. 
yeah. highly fungal, fungally dominant uh, matrix will break this stuff down uh, to a non-detectable uh, tertiary metabolite, which is which is really beneficial. And the only reason they're coming out with 5X Roundup right now is because there are bacteria out there now readily breaking down um, the glyphosate into other metabolites that are not affecting the weed pressure. So Mother Nature is going to fix all this shit, man. She's going to scratch our asses the fuck off this planet, and then she's going to turn it into a lush Eden Garden of Eden again. And so we don't really have to worry about her as much as we have to worry about each other because you know we are we are killing ourselves. But let's let's reel the negativity back in and go back positive. Um, Bart, have you had any experience in this relationship between calcium and nitrogen? Um, because when I did the GOM experiment, I did apply some calcium, some mineral uh, rock dusts. And what I had was I went from having 0.5 um, nitrogen in the control um, GOM and the one that I aerobically or uh, I uh, thermophilically shut it down, arrested it. Uh, my nitrogen was now five and I had a five, five, three, one, which is an organic fucking fertilizer made from gum, which I have no control of C to N relationship. None. I mean, you're, the trucks just keep rolling in. There's greens, there's browns. There's no way they can separate this shit. Everything mm -hmm. just gets fed into the grinder and puke the fuck out the other end. So there's no chance that you're ever going to get a proper C to N relationship. But with the addition of those mineral powders, I took this GOM that's gassing off ammonia and making methane on the bottom of the pile and turn it into a 5531 five, fertilizer. So have you had any experience in this kind of weird relationship between calcium bumping nitrogen and not competing with it? I have. I have. And uh, actually, we end up adding a decent bit of calcium to our compost in the process. And I have found that it helps hold a certain level of the nitrogen in past just the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And, you know, we're always kind of more chasing like Albrecht than Steiner or something like that. Uh, and so I would say that's half of why we add calcium uh, is just to have our compost more in ratio. And, you know, if I, if I was coming at composting purely as, um, a place for um, kind of uh, our local municipalities to put their green waste, um, it would be a different story. But because we're making a very specific living organic product for horticulture, where I need all of my mineral ratios in ratio, um, then uh, we, we have to use the same feedstocks every time. And so we kind of uh, end up selecting this specific mix and it's based and i see in the comments some people are asking um uh you know what our feedstocks are and primarily we're we're using chicken litter and um a few different types of wood byproducts to start our compost out with but then uh it uh, uh oh the cat's cat's having some issues here hold on watch out i'll bring poe on we'll have a cat dog yeah <laughs> there we go. Cat got its claw stuck in the couch there. Got to rescue the cat. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, there you go. Whoop. It's all cats and dogs. He heard the cat and he was like, whoa, whoa, wait, where? Where's, hey, where's the cat? <laughs> Get it. But uh, point being that, um, you know, we compost in a certain kind of a way because it allows us to have the most consistency and to make the same product year after year after year. And then we modify for that. I mean, we do sell it by itself. And so that's half of the reason I add the calcium in the process is to make sure our compost is closer to an Albrecht ratio. And then as well, it allows those calciums, especially kind of the carbonate type calciums, to be pre-digested by the microbes in the compost process. But interestingly enough, we did notice that same effect that Leighton has seen that we were able to hold more nitrogen in the compost when we got our calciums up into ratio. And so, yeah, that's kind of where things start for us in our process is adding humates and adding various calcium products, um, 
usually usually like uh, you know calcitic lime, oyster shell flour, dolomite lime, things like that to to get our calcium to magnesium into ratio and to in the end it turns out by accident it helps hold nitrogen and I personally wouldn't have known that but you know it's there in the test so um, it's it's definitely a beneficial byproduct I never saw that kind of like huge 500 percent increase like you've had Leighton but um, you know you obviously have some different feedstocks yet again so yeah I got tons of greens Right. So those greens are, are, you know, instead of volatizing, they're they're concentrating into a more stable, organic form of nitrogen, which is, you know, really beneficial. And, and I want you to all think of back about when we used to use outhouses. What was always in the outhouse? It was a bag of fucking lime. Right. And that there kept the odor down. It slowed down the thermophilic process. And the odor is that volatization of, of the nitrogen. Um, and then when you moved the fucking, when you moved that outhouse, holy shit, did the forest come back there real quick? <laughs> yeah. So holy shit, holy shit, <laughs> holy shit is right, dude. Hey, uh, Bart, can you kind of explain why your philosophy is more towards the Albrecht side than the Steiner side for somebody newer to kind of going down all these rabbit holes at once today? Sure. Yeah, they were they were both around kind of in a similar period. Um, and, uh, you know, Steiner did some great work, um, but a lot of what we see now from Steiner's work, I feel like tends to lead a little more towards mysticism and in some cases almost religion. Um, you know, I've, I've had biodynamic experts tell me that I shouldn't make a climate battery greenhouse because the hot air pipe under the ground will pick up luciferic energy. You know, and I'm like, the fuck you say? Like, that just drives me completely nuts. Um, whereas Albrecht was a consummate scientist, and he was one of the pioneering scientists uh, of the time who was um, showing that there's this advanced biology in the soil, that um, there's advanced chemistry, that there are all of these reactions happening. And he did the experiments that um, and it was real interesting for me because I knew from my growth test anecdotally that I had, you know, pretty good things going on with my living soils. And I started using living soils, you know, over 30 years ago. Uh, but when I started making them commercially, I had to kind of dive deeper. And once I caught on to Albrecht, um, I was like, whoa, this is really cool. These are the experiments that I've been wanting to do for, you know, 10, 20 years. And this guy did them back in 1930 and 1940, a lot of them, and really proved that there is this relationship between all of the minerals and getting them in ratio. And, uh, and I just appreciate his methodical, science-y um, kind of mindset versus, you know, somebody trying to explain to me how a greenhouse um, heat vent's going to get me luciferic energy because it's in the soil, but the plant's roots aren't going to get that same luciferic energy in the soil. And then they get all indignant when I bring that up, that the plant's roots are in the soil. And, you know, on the other hand, I, I have some great friends who are deep in biodynamics. Um, I see some really good things. I can scope like a biodynamic horn prep and find microbes in there that I won't generate in my normal composting process. So there are things to, you know, biodynamicism, Steinerism that I think have a lot of value, but he gets worshipped as kind of this like neo deutsche shaman, almost godlike figure or something like that. And Albrecht kind of got run over by the chemical companies after World War II, and he doesn't get much play. So I personally have just found a lot more value in the works of Albrecht as a scientist and as a pioneer in organics than I do in um, in biodynamics personally. So I and guess you know, that's kind of my take on that. And I agree with you 100%. I mean, he definitely, he got woo. Um, and, and some of it has value, but I think that the extremists took it to the extreme and started getting crazy about, oh, you know, these arterial forces and 
But again, if you reel back into the understanding that both plants and, and animals are very, very uh, heavily concentrated in water, and then you start to think about the influences of just the moon alone creating high and low tides, um, there has to be something to this energy that where, you know, Albright didn't necessarily take energy into consideration. He took those biogeochemical uh, reactions into effect where Steiner didn't. And so, yeah, he got run over by the chemical companies, kind of like friggin' Tesla got run over by Edison. And, exactly. And it's a shame because, you know, those would have advanced humans. They would have they would have helped us evolve into a better species that was working with Mother Nature. So not living of or living off the planet, but living of the planet. And there's a huge difference to that. And, you know, that goes back to human nature where, oh, my God, you've got something better than me. I'm going to fucking stamp your ass out so that I'm now king. And it's it's a shame. We've, we've done this, you know, over and over and over again. Um, that's it. And that's where the illegalization of cannabis came from, the prohibition of cannabis. And it all kind of happened in that same era. And it was for some reason, it was a big go to move for the ultra wealthy of the day was to seize this control. And when you have a product like hemp that could, you know, be used in cars and medicine and Feed, everything, everything. They all looked around and said, ah, what's the one thing that we can kill that's going to give all of us more of a monopoly? And it was hemp. And it was the exact same thing. You had all these guys that were really good at making nitrates. Um, the Germans learned real hard how good we were at making nitrates. And when they got through dropping all those nitrates on Germany and they had these huge factories built for this, they needed another market and they were some of the wealthiest, most powerful people in the country at the time. And they came back home and there was only one dude who was the head of soil science at the University of Missouri who was standing in their way. And that was Albrecht. And he was telling everyone, hey, you need calcium, you need magnesium, you need zinc, you need manganese, you need boron, you need the microbes. He was part of the teams of people who first understood that legumes were nitrogen fixers and that it was through an interaction with rhizobia. And so those, those things that today we kind of in our community think of as like, pretty much just um, given knowledge. He was one of the first people in this world who ever got onto those concepts and did the science that figured out how important all of these um, different mineral elements are to, to good plant health. And the chemical companies didn't want to hear it. They wanted to hear that NP and K salts is all you need. And um, they were, they were going to make that happen one way or the other. And it was really Charles Walters and Neil Kinsey who kind of saved Albrecht's work from the trash can of time. Um, you know, Charles Walters was the publisher of Acres Magazine, one of the founders, if not the founder. And, uh, and so he and Kinsey were the last students of Albrecht. And they went to him and spent years going through all of his notes and papers with him and concatenated into, I think, a 12 volume set of books that you can get from Acres Press that um, goes deep into this work. And so it was really cool, like seeing that I had gotten almost to the same place Albrecht had on my own, but then learning about Albrecht opened up a few um, last little aha moments for me. And I changed a bit of my formulation. That was about five or six years ago. And when I did get those last few minerals exactly into ratio, I unlocked a whole nother level of plant growth. And, uh, and so, yeah, I'm really into it, but you know, don't want to disparage Steiner. And as you pointed out, Leighton, there's like a lot of stuff going on in this world that we can't see or understand. So I'm not going to say just because I can't see it with my microscope or quantify it, that there's not a lot of amazing plant energy stuff that happens, you know? And, and so I feel like there is something in Steiner's work with that, but that really as far as the the biology and the mineral plant health go albrecht was a world ahead and was one of our great pioneers in soil science now bart you had mentioned that um when you've done some of steiner's kind of like the horn putting the horn in, in the in the mound and, and kind of letting that sit for a while um 
And then you had mentioned that you've achieved microbes that you hadn't seen before. Uh, did I hear that correctly? At least not in our thermophilic process. And I would kind of liken it a bit to the microbes in KNF or something like that. Um, I personally tend to lean as much more of an aerobic guy, um, but there are some anaerobic processes and obviously um, anaerobicism happens in nature and has a very valuable place in the whole scheme and system of things. It's just that most of your pathogens tend to be anaerobes, both human and plant. Um, a lot of these toxic chemicals are made in anaerobic conditions, but um, in the right environment. And I think that's some of the real genius of Steiner was he, he came up with some of these anaerobic prepared concoctions uh, and, and is able to drive some microbial species diversity out of it. So for us, it, that's what the biodynamics bring to us on a quantifiable level is that we get some even yet again more species diversity out of those preps and then are sprayed on the pile by our biodynamics expert Lloyd Nelson and um, and I do feel like there's a quantifiable benefit there to that so, so you know let's, let's wind that up a little bit so that the audience understands so the, I think it's the 505 or 506 prep where you're basically taking cow manure so green manure, hot, stinky, packing it in a horn, um, burying it a certain depth, facing a certain direction at a certain time of the year. I think it's the fall on a certain moon and then digging that up six months later and taking that the what's in the horn, which is no longer manure. It's not stinky. It is, it is rich humus. Um, it's completely aerobic. So you put it through an anaerobic process, but when you're harvesting it, it's coming back aerobic. And that's where you see these diversities that you're not going to see in a thermophilic process. And that kind of goes back to, you know, some of the early work I did with, with um, aquaculture. So I was taking this horribly smelling shit um, and aerobically stabilizing it through, you know, the introduction of, of bubbles and atmospheric air and bubbling it to a point where it turned to sweet, uh, sweet smell. And that's when I knew I was on target and then I would scope it and I would see nothing but billions of anaerobes. And, and of course, there were some facultative anaerobes or oxygen tolerant anaerobes, which in many ways is the bridge to taking dirt to soil, is, is providing those um, interim um, facultative or oxygen tolerant anaerobes that, that are going into an, a low oxygen environment and breaking it up and beginning to build the foundation for the next level of successionary biology. So yeah, Steiner had some had some techniques and methods that were important at the time as far as its discovery. And then, you know, I think that both angles of this are just as important to take into consideration because yeah, he was very much more energy driven than Albright was. So, um, you know, Take it for what it is, but to define right is to define everything else is wrong, and to define something is wrong is to define everything else is right. And I think that's a very, very poor approach to, you know, one's own self um, discovery. Is like just because someone says you can't do it, doesn't mean that it isn't going to work for you. <laughs> Check the chat, man. You guys blow each other up over. Oh, I do this, and it works great for me. <laughs> that's it. Boy. That is exactly it. There's a in million your, ways to get to the same place. In your opinion, why? What's the point of like the carrier, the horn? Is there something? Is that just because that calcium. was around, or is there calcium, calcium and nitrogen, dude? Nitrogen in the manure, and but that's going to get broken down in six months. No, well, the, the horn and, stays intact, but for whatever reason, I'm sure it's been thinned a little bit. Well, well the horn is mostly keratin. And so oh, that's the thing about keratin is that it's a very complex folded protein and it has this incredible resistance. It, I would call keratin probably the most stable form of nitrogen that there is, um, especially in nature. You know, like we, we've all seen that experience of uh, hooves or feathers, things like this. If a cow dies, some of the last things that are going to be left are its horns and its hooves. And, um, and in fact, you need the, the biology to be able to break keratin down at all to deliver it to plants. And so the keratin's like a long, slow time release nitrogen. 
and then the manure is a mix of you know NP and K. Um, but um, with Steiner trying to quantify the science behind it is tough because a lot of it's energy. When you, I don't know if you've ever been to a, a biodynamics class or anything, Leighton, but like in the ones I've been to, you know, you'll when you're mixing that manure, you'll need to walk clockwise and counterclockwise turning the manure ideally by hand. Like I've watched people spend hours turning a tiny bit of manure with their hands, walking clockwise and counterclockwise to change the way the energy flows. I'm not going to personally say whether that actually does something or not, but in my own science, I can't get a noticeable result just from turning manure a certain direction in the moonlight at the right time. Now, can I scope that horn prep when it's done and be like, oh, cool, here's some species I haven't seen? Definitely. So, you know, it's, it's tricky for me to play this world between kind of this mysticism, which may or may not be real. I just may be too limited in my understanding to really understand it. But for me, what I need is results. And without those results, without it's, it's why I love grow tests. Like it's the most simple form of science we can all do. Like you can take my soil and you can take Fox farm or roots or build a soil and you can take two identical clones and grow against it. And you're going to see a result. And every person on this program can do that in, um, you know, a 10 to 15 to 20 day period. And so I really encourage people to do those like, easy, low hanging science experiments for themselves to know what the best is. And that's how we beat all this hype. And, you know, I came from an era before the internet. I was, I was growing before there were forums and things like that. And people talk a lot about the forum OGs or this, that they forget that there's those of us that were out there before the forums, you know, Faust, he, he's been growing cannabis for 50 years straight or whatever he said, like, you know, there are some real OGs in this. And just because you ain't on the forums doesn't mean you're not a scientist. So, um, you know, I feel like that's the forums have a little bit of an ability to be this echo chamber. And when one person starts talking about something and everybody believes in them, that mm -hmm. becomes kind of what the whole the whole Internet thinks is a fact when it may or may not be. So I guess that's kind of my point there. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up and clarified the, the horn composition, but also the fact that, that you had to stir. Like after you made the preps, you had to stir a certain direction for a certain period of time. So, yeah, there is definitely a little bit more uh, woo-woo mysticism on, on the Steiner side of, of things versus Albright. But again, you know, there's lessons to be learned from all of this shit. So That's it. Up. That's it. And do I want Hugh Lovell's? cosmic ray pipes to work i do i really do like i think that would be the coolest thing if we could prove that time and time again i just personally haven't seen the evidence like and and can i believe that star light and stuff like that can be a magic energy that could help plants yes i believe like straight like x files but i also am a scientist and have to somewhat otherwise we're just kind of scattershot all over like you can try this you can try that and that's what i see i see a bunch of people that get kind of caught up in these things like biochar and biodynamics and this and that who um you know put all of their energy into this path and then at the end of the season still have a lousy crop and that's what i hate seeing because you know, I want people to be successful growers. I want them to be able to grow their own food, grow their own medicine. And I know that we all have a limited amount of time that we have to, um, to utilize to get from point A to point B. And so I'm 100% in on the spirituality, the mysticism. But if it doesn't get you the result and you spent $1,000 or $5,000 and your farm fails because you didn't, you know, you didn't have the right amount of nitrogen and calcium in your soil. Like that's where it seems crazy to me. And where once again, it just seems like yet another um, kind of dogmatic system that isn't getting people to the final prize. And the final prize 
is fully mineralized, healthy food, um, fully turpinized, healthy medicine, and the healthiest plants without all of these chemicals that we know are toxic to us as human beings. That That is the core prize, or should be to me, of any of these systems with or without the mysticism that surrounds so many of them. When, when you gave them the rebuttal of like, what about the, the roots in the soil? Was there a, like a different meta, you know, metaphysical answer or did that stump them? I, I never got an answer back on that one actually. And, and it's just really interesting to me. You know, I grew up in a, a very Christian Episcopalian family in Colorado Springs. And I've kind of gotten away from believing those kinds of things. I have my own spirituality, of course, but I've seen Christianity do so many wrongs in this world against the people of this world that I'm certainly not going to just jump on some train that's once again pushing this kind of like modern Christianity based on the teaching of a Deutsche shaman from over 100 years ago like that as as cool as that sounds it's just not what i'm into i'm into helping people grow the most healthiest food and medicine medicine as cheaply as possible and i think that's what's important and that just is what makes me different than a catholic priest or something like that well that and probably a couple other things too we'll say but <laughs> nonetheless <laughs> Well, I, I agree, I agree <laughs> 100 percent with you that, you know, I think that modern religion forgot the purpose. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. Simple, That's it. Well, simplest of all things that came out of religion. And really? that totally got forgotten. I mean, they, they killed, they maimed, they butchered, they doctrinated. They, I mean, all of that crap as, as religion spread across the, the world. They forgot the foundation. <laughs> truly, truly. And so, you know, I'm in no way saying don't be spiritual, but I am saying watch out for dogma. And especially when the dogma is masquerading as science, um, you know, I feel like that has much less of a place in feeding people than um, getting the mineral ratios in your soil right. Oh, I'm, I'm sure some people are going to be mad at me about that, but so be it. That's just yeah. who I am. I yeah. tell it like I see it. I'm, I'm with you, my friend. And and yes, I, I encourage spirituality. And if, if it takes religion to open your eyes to spirituality, all the power to you. I'm not going to define right or wrong. But I think at the end of the day that, that as Brian and I have talked millions of times, that if the energy is there, if the vibe is there, if if people are vibing at a very high level, then really positive things come out of it. Whereas everybody's moping around, pissed off and over competing with each other. Shit goes fucking sideways. So there is definitely an influence that should be taken into consideration um, about yourself and your positive mm -hmm. energy and your positive influence on your environment around you, whether it's in the grow or out in the fucking grocery store. It doesn't matter. But there's just so much negativity out there right now. that, And again, what does this have to do with biochar? <laughs> <laughs> a lot, believe it or not. Um, you know, it's, it's again about good intentions and, and respecting um, both the environment and, and what you're doing to get there. And, you know, I love what you talk about, Bart, as a side-by-side -side test. And so many people don't do this. And it's so fucking easy. Whether it's your watering regimen you know, underwater, overwater, or whether it's, you know, nutrient balance or soil, ver this soil versus that soil, you can learn so much so quickly um, within a short period of time by doing little things like side-by-side -side tests. So I really encourage that into the chat that you guys, you know, take those words to, to heart man, and learn. Uh, there was a follow-up when I was talking about like charcoal to um, biochar. Um, if you, if you understand decently how to make compost, I'm paraphrasing it. If you, if you know how to make a compost tea, Bart, um, and you're kind of trying to do this for pennies on the dollar, then just buying charcoal, like plant, plant grade, horticultural charcoal, uh, and then spraying it with some compost teas to charge it. Uh, that's going to be a lot more cost effective, at least, uh, than buying charged biochar. 
Um, do you think there's benefit in doing it that way or? Um, sure. Yeah, no, I think that's a great way to do it. And especially if you have a limited amount of compost or you're in a potassium toxic situation, uh, something like that. Uh, you know, we were, we were just recently consulting for the Denver Botanic Gardens on a situation where, you know, they've got great soil, but they once again are a little over on their potassium. And so now they're going to use, um, you know, compost tea as that kind of um, charge without the, the potassium and to deliver that biology both to the soil and as well, it would, it would be just as easy to deliver it to biochar. And I've seen people do that successfully. And once again, those like aerobic microbes, especially the fungal ones, are pretty delicate when they're like not in the soil itself, when they're not in the environment where they want to thrive. So if you do a pre-inoculated biochar and then it sits in a bag in the sun for weeks and days, and then eventually you get it to your place and it sits in the sun a little more, and then you put it out on a parched, scorched field, and then it's in the sun some more, the amount of fungal organisms that you're going to deliver are going to be pretty minimal. On the other hand, if you do something like that yourself, and, and better, I think, even than like charging the biochar before application would be applying the biochar, trying to work it into the soil. Um, you know, once, once again, here, now we can get into the till, no-till, how are you going to work it in? But even in a no-till environment, the soil microbes are going to come up and they're going to bring that biochar down. So at least kind of like maybe using, let's say, in a field of power harrow or something like that to work your biochar in without deep tillage and then coming back and spraying a tea over the top of it, I think is going to be far superior to any pre-inoculated biochar you can find, especially once again, because the biochar itself has detrimental effects on certain species. And that is not debated. Any, any of the research I've ever seen on biochar doesn't debate that it's going to kill some species of soil microbes and uh, soil insects. So, um, you know, I think keeping those things separate until application is probably a better way to go personally. And when it, come in, when it comes to, you know, I guess finding this out, uh, and and you maybe you still kind of wanted to use biochar or something. Do you think there's other ways, like maybe going a little heavier on wood chips or leaves or something, to kind of uh, maybe just give a little bit of extra for those fungal aspects to stay? Or is biochar so disruptive that over time it's just going to become negative no matter what you're doing? No, I don't think it is. I think in like small quantities, and once again, in kind of relationship to everything else, it's it's all it's it's kind of einsteinian in a way like einstein had his theory of relativity that like time is relative to um you know your speed your your rate of movement which is crazy same thing here you've got these um situations where like everything is relative and so a little bit of biochar like i would i would say under one or two percent biochar in a mix is going to have a relatively negligible effect on um, your overall species diversity but you get up to five seven ten percent biochar and that's where i really see this huge drop off in species diversity and so you know i think it's important just to to remember you know any anything's good uh at the right amount like boron can be extremely toxic but at two parts per million boron is probably one of your most beneficial plant health uh, minerals. And so, you know, but at like 100 parts per million, boron's going to kill everything and, and including you. So you, you know, it, it like everything just has to be used. You, more of something isn't always necessarily a good thing. And Brian, you know, you, you, you hit on something, right? What is biochar? Biochar is carbon. It has been used heat and pressure to change it from a lignin based material into a more refined carbon based material. But that's the same as coal, dude. It's the same fucking thing, except for you did it quick instead of waiting millions of years to make it. But at the end of the day, it's fucking carbon. It all goes back to the carbon again. So many, many different forms of carbon from liquid, from 
easily digestible to rock to fucking something that's going to take a long, long time to break down. That's where this conversation gets fucking complex. <laughs> Truly. For the for the lay lay person, Bart, would you say that like having all this diverse maybe forms of carbon, finding ways to keep that microbial life up so that it hopefully is improving month after month, year after year, uh, is that now just kind of now you're mining currency? So now this this utopia that you're trying to build now has the resources, the carbon to continue to build out. The mycorrhizal fungi and all that has the resources to be able to build out because the microbial life uh, is there. Do you think there's such an interaction between all of that that everything in the rhizosphere kind of needs a little bit of an extra boost? Everybody has a little bit more money in their pocket. And then that's when things really start to take off. For sure. Yeah. It That diversity, I, I to me, diversity is everything. Diversity of, um, you know, species in your soil, diversity of uh, your minerals, diversity of even even of your carbons. And so, um, you know, in the rainforest, you're not going to have carbon in just one form, as Leighton just pointed out, you're going to have it in a, a bunch of different forms. And yes, I think overall, generally, that's just helpful to have more diverse types of carbon. And, it, and to keep this simplistic as we're going through this, Leighton, it does seem like, at least in the microbial world, uh, that nobody gets uh, egos. There's not there's not jealousy because everybody's riding around in fancy cars. It does seem like the utopia does exist in the microbial world because they make sure that everybody's moving in a symbiotic relationship. It, um if that, I guess, in whatever form, even with my mycorrhizal fungi, if that symbiotic relationship is broken from one side or, to, or the other, it is cut off instantly, which it really makes sense from a um, currency standpoint. Like you're not going to just take from us. So we're going to cut you off there. Um, and again, with the worlds upon worlds upon worlds kind of metaphor, this is where I really start to like uh, the microbial world because it does seem like it has more of a street mentality uh, to a point where if like if you're not helping everybody over here on this corner, then, you know, we're going to come after you. We're going to make sure that you don't have the resources to take hold and take over our streets. Um, <laughs> careful what you wish for, dude. I mean, the microbial <laughs> world is worse than the dinosaur world. You If you stop moving, man, you're food for somebody. <laughs> and then on the other side, you have you have virus. So the viruses are also working in conjunction with the environment to decide whether this group of bacteria is out of line or, or they're not out of line. So if they get out of line internally, they shut themselves down or the plant releases exudates to grow them out or the plant stops releasing exudates and starves them out. So there's a lot of interactions going on, but I agree with you overall that in a really healthy soil system, you're going to get a balance and that balance, as long as it's not exposed to an extreme, um, is going to work as a community um, to allow this plant to to hit its full potential. So diversity, diversity. Yes. And will will there be uh, a utopian end in a very well balanced soil system? with a lot of diversity absolutely that, and that's again the, the foundation of this conversation is is always been about how do we achieve full genetic potential or as close to it as we can and then you start adding in all of these factors like you know bart and the work that he's done in understanding these delicate relationships with these and i want to call them both organic and inorganic forms of these different chemicals whether they're being brought uh, broken down out of a plant matter or whether they're a mineral powder added in to support that utopia um that all has to be taken into consideration and and understood that, that it's very complex and very delicate and you could fuck shit up real easy by throwing something out of whack truly and I hope for like people really getting into this, they realize like how quick things are really moving. And that's why we're kind of saying like it is it's a, a dog eat dog type in, environment just on a obviously on a microbial level, but on a grand scale of that where like things are moving so quick uh, that you almost have to be working in a symbiotic relationship to survive. And that's what does seem 
to, at least to me seems really cool with it is like as long as everybody within that system is like, all right, you're going out there, you're finding exudates, you're mining minerals for us, bringing that stuff back. All right, you get to eat from the table. The books are open. Uh, but if you fuck that up in any way, we close the books and then you're off on your own and then you naturally get eliminated. Uh, and I just kind of like that that aspect to kind of understanding more of how just soil works in general. It makes sense why the rainforest is just unbelievable, why it's so soft. There's just so much going on underneath that soil, uh, you know, underneath the wood of the rainforest uh, that I didn't even really understand when I would get to run through like old Georgia forests and stuff like that. And I really appreciate the, the I don't know, the softness to it. And there's just, in my opinion, it seems like there's such bigger trees on the East Coast and West Coast. So to be able to just run in through those huge forests like that, uh, I don't know, man, there's something special that I probably should have looked down more. <laughs> All of it. Yeah, but they are amazing that way. And that is the amazing thing about the forest floor that anyone who runs through a forest notices is that sponginess. And that sponginess is there 100% from organic matter. Like rocks aren't spongy. Uh, organic matter is. And so, you know, the forest floor is a very organic rich environment. And then, of course, you've got the animals that fall over dead and the manures and this and that. Everything works together. But primarily, it's that uh, it's that organic matter. And that's how the plants um, and the animals give back to the system even after they're dead. And it's what's beautiful about the whole thing is it is this recirculating system that has worked for millions of years and made our planet so diverse in so many ways. Yeah, nobody took anything from the system. Everything was constantly given back. Whereas when we came around as humans, we started taking, taking more than we needed so that we could use that to trade for something that we wanted or whatever the case uh, may have become. The, the end result, of course, is money. That's what, what the end result of taking more than you needed became. And look what that's turned into. A billionaires? When's going to be the first trillionaire, right? And when I grew up... A millionaire was somebody who was like, holy fuck, they have a million dollars. Mind boggling, mind boggling. And then came 100 million, then came billion. And now, now you have billion, you have trillion dollar companies. Where did that come from? That came from taking off of the earth, taking of the earth, mining, you know, water harvesting, you name it, go on and on and on and on. So we as a species have not been responsible in not taking more than we need. And that's where we should be focused more on the indigenous who lived in conjunction, in relationship with the environment, not just take, take, take. And <laughs> I don't know where I was fucking going with that because that ain't got nothing to do with biochar. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is important though, and and I think you have to have we, a latent rant. That's it. We need to learn more to be uh, not taking so much. Like there's enough. That's the thing about this planet is there's abundance. There's enough for everyone, as long as you don't have a few people trying to have the most. And um, you know, there's a lot of culture around having the most in our society. And that really, I hope, becomes less cool. I hope folks like Kanye and the Kardashians aren't as cool in 10 years. And I hope folks that give back and, um, you know, do the important things. There are a lot of salt of the earth farmers that live in my valley that don't look for anything other than to be able to make a living and provide the food and the medicine that they do for people. And I think those are the real heroes. And so that's kind of for our own survival as a species i think it's really important for us to to make that culture the cool culture not oh i bought five lambos or whatever you know like i think that just needs to quit being cool because we're all going to die if that if that keeps going in that direction and i'd rather not i'd rather have my kids have a badass rock spaceship for them and their kids future so I can't believe you said the Kardashians aren't cool, man. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yep, now I've done it. Oh, oh. Uh, let the hate flow, man. Let the hate flow. <laughs> <laughs> he went after biochar, the Kardashians, and Christians in one show. Man, this guy. 
<laughs> the trifecta. <laughs> the snipers are lining up on the hill. I can see them. <laughs> when we are talking about different sources of carbon, what do you think some of the faster, like, I, I would think like cardboard would be an example of something that can be broken down relatively quick. Are there some other things so that you have more of that progression? Do you, do you like having like a variety of things decomposing all at once? Um, I do think there's probably something to it, but um, in general, I'm able to get where I need to go on a consistent replicatable basis using primarily wood as, as my carbon source. Um, I really like how fungal organisms work with it. Um, and really, to me, the most important thing about making a carbon digest quickly is just mechanically grinding it. Like the smaller the particle you can get, the more you've made uh, surface area for those microbial colonies to get to work and do their work. Like a bacteria trying to, to dig through a log is kind of like us trying to dig to the other side of the planet. You know, they're really small. So the more that we can bring the particles into their scale, the more work they're going to be able to do. And, and this is kind of designed into nature, you know, you don't want that log to rot immediately. You want it to take 5, 10, 15, 20 years to break down and keep delivering its gift of carbon back to the environment over that time. Whereas for me, I need to make, you know, millions of pounds of compost a year, and I don't have 20 years for that to happen. So I would say more than the material, grinding it into small chunks is going to be your um, quickest way to get those organic matter, no, what, no matter what type of organic matter they are broken down. Now, obviously, if they're a liquid already, you're not going not gonna to do anything there. But um, for anything that's a solid, sure. And yeah, cardboard is already processed. And it's, um, it's something that microbes can get right into. For me, it isn't something I use in my commercial composting process just because there's the potential of toxic inks, um, you know, plastic, tape, this, all sorts of different things that get in there. Uh, but um, for my home cardboard, I do have a separate pile. And it's, it's fascinating to watch when we get the water right, the air right, the moisture right. Yeah, cardboard will just disappear in weeks, if not months. Um, so um, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting, all these different kinds of carbons and um, even in woods, the different chemicals that trees grow to try to protect themselves, you know, cedar trees and redwood trees have built in chemicals that make them highly resistant to microbial attack. And that's a great strategy as far as staying alive when you've got fungal organisms trying to eat you. But, um, you know, it's also, you know, going to delay the breakdown of those woods versus like a, an aspen or something like that it'll just disappear like that. So um, I think, I think Bart, what you're, you went all the way around, but never completed it is back to palm particulate organic matter. It, it gobble, it, the microbes will gobble it up. So you, you were spot on the finer you make that, the quicker it goes. Um, and have you ever done work with sawdust? Cause sawdust is something that's always not shavings because there's a big difference between shavings and sawdust, but sawdust always gets funky as fuck when you put it in a compost pile do you do you work with any dusts well we work with a sawdust that is a very coarse sawdust um, we work with both shavings and sawdust and chips and so when i'm building a compost pile i'm always looking at kind of this blend between the smaller particles which will get eaten up quicker and bigger particles which add to the porosity of the pile and because I'm not windrow turning, I'm, I'm blowing air through it, uh, you want that porosity. And so that's why I kind of have different size particles um, is, is just to uh, one small ones, obviously, to let the compost process happen. And um, even, even with sawdust, I don't find that it gets funky as much as um, if I don't have those fine ground particles and I'm dealing with chicken litter, I don't stop that volatilization of the ammonia. But if I do have those tiny particles, 
all of a sudden that like acrid ammonia chicken litter smell almost goes completely away. It can go away in a day or two. And instead it'll be replaced with this very odd smell that now after years of experience, I would almost liken to something like um, pinene or a terpene like that, but it has this kind of minty piney freshness to it uh, when it's in balance. And so, um, yeah, I, I really like that. And I, I like that a coarse sawdust can bring that right to bear uh, in a short amount of time. One, it makes my neighbors happier with me. And two, I feel like it holds a lot of the ammonia in those really fine particles, but you don't want to use all fine particles. You want small particles, mid particles, and some large particles. And the large wood chips get screened back out in the screening process, and then they become an inoculant for another round. Well, we're talking different things. I've noticed too, when I've been playing around with more like bark and that kind of stuff, uh, it seems like the the springtails take hold a little bit easier for, for individuals that maybe are having issues. And I just bought a, a thousand thing of rove beetles to now try to see if I can also get the rove beetle to take hold a little bit easier uh, now that I have these springtail populations that are taken off. Um, have you messed around with any of those like soil dwelling uh, beneficials? Yeah, we have a pretty significant springtail population naturally in our compost. Um, I haven't done much to try to push them in a direction. Um, of course, they don't make it through the thermophilic stage. So you have to have this kind of re-inoculation set up. Um, in the curing phase, they will come in from the outside. And I feel like that's kind of the biggest difference in compost producers is a lot of these guys that are turning and burning and doing, you know, hundreds of millions of tons a year or something like that. They're really not giving the compost the proper time to cure. And I feel like that's as important as any uh, portion of the, of the compost process if you want this species diversity. And so um, that's really where the springtails and a lot of the other beneficials come back into the pile is in that curing phase after it's cooled down after they're not going to get scorched out and uh and yeah i feel like um springtails do certainly love a little bit of a wood product and and it gets tricky because a lot of us you know have heard horror stories about people dumping a lot of sawdust or wood product into their garden and then having what the industry has termed nitrogen lockout which um I feel is purely just, uh, let's call it microbial uh, competition for nitrogen and the microbes are going to win. And so if you've got that excess, uh, excess nitrogen, then the microbes are going to vent it as ammonia gas. But if you have too little um, or, or sorry, excess carbon in the soil, your microbes are going to go and steal the nitrogen from the soil. And so, you know, wood has gotten kind of a bad rap, but composted wood products are a different story because now they've been bioconverted to something else. And yet again, um, you know, if you're amending nitrogen or make sure you have nitrogen in the proper ratio, which personally to me, I like my compost piles to land somewhere at maybe like, you know, I'll start out at a 23, 24 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. And by the end, I'll be at a 16 or 18 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. And I feel like that's the highest amount of nitrogen that I can get out of the natural process and utilizing the most nitrogen without then volatilizing it. But yeah, all those, all those other beneficials love that. That's where all the species diversity comes in is in the cure. Um, Brian, what type of bark are you using? Uh, it, it's a bark that I'm buying from uh, a local garden center. And then I'm uh, heating it uh, for 20 minutes at 200 degrees. Uh, and then I'm using it as like a, a basically a top dress for my isopod bins. And having that in, con in conjunction with cork bark, I don't know if those two woods are, are different, but it, it, maybe I should check that on what tree it is. But um that's kind of what i'm asking is it a hardwood is it a softwood is it a conifer what, what? yeah it seems like it might be a, a mixed bag 
I'll uh, I'll get that information. We'll give that next week. In uh, Colorado, have... most of the bark is coniferous. Um, there's a lot of pine and spruce. Okay, um, I would imagine it's pine because it kind of smells like that, obviously. And then there's some other stuff kind of mixed in there. But the 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 bark itself is there something maybe kind of magical within that where it's like yeah it's a wood source but at the same time it i don't know some of it is brittle some of it is hard or um springtails seem to be love breaking both of those things down the isopods are crawling up in there and having more babies it seems like it's increasing reproduction rates because of the bark itself is, is there something to maybe um there might be i frankly don't know but here's where we get to learn from your science on what what uh what is possible and i would say that certainly obviously the tree grows the bark different than the heartwood um, it's obviously a different looking substance so um, i feel like there could be a significant mineral difference there in most of my tests i don't see on a npk carbon sulfur calcium level a big difference between bark and um, heartwood but the tree puts different chemicals into the heartwood, different chemicals into the bark. So I could certainly believe that there would be a difference. And it'll be fascinating to see what you find um, in your bins, because those are perfect little worlds of science uh, that are isolated and where you can use a control to um, find out what something does or doesn't do. So yeah, here's, here's to your work and to what you find on that. Let me know. Yeah, it, it's fun to just continue to go down this rabbit hole, but also in the back of my mind, remember that the more I can hopefully use of Mother Nature, the easier it seems for this stuff to be. Uh, you know, even if you're growing uh, microgreens or cut flowers, like if you just have a, a skill set with soil, opportunities arise for yourself. Exactly. Um. Bart, I thought we lost you there. Yeah, no, I was going to yeah. ask Bart. Do you use a lot of bark in your in your process? I don't use bark. Um, I haven't really found a source that I've felt was clean. And uh, you know, it's it's a crazy thing here in Colorado. Um, we have a lot of rules, especially in the canna sector. Uh, we were one of the first states to really do a lot of heavy metals type stuff. And um, you know, in the wood world there's these synthetic perithrums. Uh, it sounds like perithrin, but it has an M instead of an N. And they're now highly regulated in certain industries. And, uh, you know, we're talking parts per trillion here is the allowable limit. And a lot of the forests in Colorado are sprayed with perithrums to try to combat the pine bark beetle. And so I have to be really careful about my feedstock sources and I haven't been able to find a bark producer. Most of the bark producers, I feel like, are just kind of turn and burn. Um, that, and and it's also kind of the outer coating of the tree, and so a lot of sources turn up hot for these perithrums, and uh, and so for various reasons, I've had to kind of stay away from the bark over the years, just because it isn't as consistent as I would like it to be. Whereas the, the sawdust, the chips, and the shavings um, are always the same. I can always get that material. I can get it in the, you know, 20, 30, 40, if not 100 semis of the material that I need at a time. And, uh, and, I, and it's always the same. And so for me, that's a huge part of uh, uh, kind of the, uh, the game is these consistent feed stocks. Uh, and then clean feed stocks, and then, you know, spending a year after with those feed stocks and trying to turn them into this other magic substance, which um, is compost. Well, that's that's really interesting about the the buildup of that um, pesticide. Um, interesting. I I didn't know they were that crazy spraying the mountains and the valleys and shit. Yeah, the Forest Service does it. Uh, pine bark beetle is a huge pest here. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, if you if you even drive like I-70, a part of the state more people have seen than others, you can see these huge patches of dead trees. 
And it's kind of what drives some of the forest fire stuff. It's really been a problem. But once again, spraying synthetics in a pristine environment just seems like the wrong way to go about it to me. I would approach it in trying to figure out more natural predators of those insects and um, in, in trying to uh, make the entire forest in general more healthy rather than this kind of symptom treating thing that we as humans like to do so much. We go after the symptom, not the disease. So it's, it's kind of the same thing. And I know it really causes problems for a lot of producers. Um, the same way that heavy metals do, you know, several of my competitors are having problems for heavy metals because it wasn't as important to them. Heavy metals have always been extremely important for us. And so it wasn't a big deal when the heavy metals laws came, came into being, we were able to pass all those tests. Same thing for, um, for these synthetic perithrin type substances. So yeah, it's, uh, you, you never know what's out there and you never know what, what bad things are being introduced into the environment that most of us have never heard of or thought of. Yeah, it's funny. Um, we as a species talk about evasive species. There's no such thing as an evasive species. Invasive? It's, yeah, invasive, right. Yep. There's no such thing. I mean, nature has always been in a state of flux. Something comes up, rises up, gets pushed back. But in the process, they've changed the ecology. And so, you know, we as a species come in and say, oh, well, we got a spray for this. Uh, we brought them in or they moved in, they came in, whatever. That's that's just nature, man. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot, a lot of mm -hmm. hate on this one. But, you know, I don't care where you are. Um, over the course of hum or not even humanity, the evolution of the planet, there were all different types of this kind of uh, successionary changes and shifts within whether it was weather related or insect related or, or fungal related. But yeah, one thing dies off. Another thing comes in and takes its place. It's just, there we you know. control it. And now, now we're now, now we're fucking spraying shit in a pristine forest. You know, it's kind of like what they did up in Vermont and New Hampshire. They went through these national forests and sprayed fucking roundup underneath the, the high tension wires. Can you believe you know? it? How they fucking get away with this shit, I'll never understand. Yeah. No, it's, right. it's I ran bad. downstairs real quick. Um, it's Mountain West Products Bark, and it's from Idaho. Is there okay. something maybe unique from the trees in Idaho? or Does it say what tree species it is? It just literally says Mountain West Bark, and it's from a company called Mountain West Products. What does it look like? Is it like, can is it clumpy or is it ground yeah, up? Let me go grab some real quick. Yeah, yeah. Gr grab a handful of it. Idaho is going to be coniferous mostly, though, for sure. Yeah, same. So probably very fast. While we're waiting, there was a question a, a while back about. Um, hold on, let me. <laughs> sorry to, sorry to cover your face. Sorry to cover your face, but uh, <laughs> compost and you test it and it does have too much. Like what? What? Like what? What's a remediation strategy? Um, getting everything else back into ratio, like, uh, you know, boosting your calcium, your magnesium, your, uh, and, and in particular night, your, your nitrogen really, um, more, more meat, <laughs> you know, just, uh, you, you need those animals that made the manure, you need their bodies to bring it back into balance, or you need a bunch of beans, or if you're you know, if you're vegan, it, this is not a very popular opinion with a lot of vegans, but nonetheless, um, it it is the case. And amino, uh, flesh-based aminos are really great for plants. Plants love them. Fungal organisms love them. Um, and so you're you talking know, blood, blood and bone, meals blood, and bone, skin, connective tissue, all of it. Like. I've got, I've got farmers here who are these really great agronomists. They're really conscious. They raise cows, ranchers, um, raising cattle. It's some of our best like organic beef. Yet when you look at their process, they're um, taking this animal waste and sending it to the landfill 
and then they're going out and buying nitrate fertilizers to fertilize the grass and they're in this cycle and now with it's it's really interesting where we are in the world with nitrates the cost of nitrates are skyrocketing and that was happening before the whole war in ukraine and russia is one of the great producers of nitrates so we were in a crisis with nitrates um, before the war and now it's doubled and so most of the cost of these nitrate fertilizers are 300 400 percent over what they were last year and so to me being a producer that takes all of this animal byproduct and throws it in the landfill which is to me far superior source of nitrogen than a nitrate when you could be you know grinding it composting it um, and adding that to the manure compost and now you've created a balanced compost it's just a lot better way of, of thinking about it. But yeah, anything you can do to get back into ratio to boost everything else up, you know, and, and I've kind of tangled with um, CSU on this a little bit, like they'll at times tell people, oh, just abandon that land or something like that because it's so potassium toxic. And I can't see that the land's too valuable. You just need to boost everything else. Just go hard with feather meal, go hard with um, blood and bone meal go hard with and and you know blood meal is interesting because it doesn't have that keratin component it's going to be a really quick turn and burn nitrogen amino nitrogen whereas the keratin something like feather meals half soluble half keratin that keratin component is going to last forever so the more like hooves and feathers and hair things like that is going to be this long time release nitrogen source so I, my, my, uh, my advice there is boost every, every other mineral. Yeah. And just you, make sure if you want to go the, the blood meal route that you spend the money for quality stuff, uh, you can really mess up a garden if you use shit blood meal. Uh, so that's just a small little caveat on that. For sure. Uh, yeah. this is what the stuff kind of looks like. Um, you see, it's, Yeah, that's big and chunky. And then it also has this kind of stuff. So when I when I've been adding this, the springtails kind of go up into the crevices, and then also the uh, isopods, obviously. And um, then when I'm throwing some of the IMOs I'm getting from Johnny and Marco, uh, that obviously starts to take hold in pieces like this. So it's interesting to see if maybe this would be something that you could speed up the fungal aspects using bark, um, you know, with your living soil systems. Cool. Yeah. Another good experiment. Yeah. It looks like a combination of both uh, conifers and uh, softwoods because that other stuff looks more like, like a birch that's peeled off. Yeah. This kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 But they'll hide up like up in here and stuff. Yeah. Uh, which... Again, I mean, this stuff's relatively cheap at the high-end garden centers, for what I know. So um, I encourage you guys just to play around with stuff. And uh, Bart, you have your uh, your recipes dialed in, man. So that's something that I always like commend because you have so many different um, amendments and, and things that seem to work together. Uh, do, do you mind kind of talking about why you use certain things and uh, you, you know, you mentioned why you stay away from biochar. So maybe if there's anything else that you prefer to stay away from. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I don't really do much with Bokashi. Um, and, and that's another one of these uh, types of, of things that can be great. But, um, you know, it it really just became the darling of a certain segment of the forums. And, uh, and I'm trying to do aerobic and Bokashi is a method uh, done with a relatively small number of species in a anaerobic environment. And um, does it have its benefit potentially, but on a, a large scale, when we're trying to get as much aerobic species diversity, uh, I don't get an advantage out of Bokashi. So, um, you know, uh, I guess that's probably the other place I probably made a bunch of people mad there today, but um, none, nonetheless, that's what I've found. And, uh, and have you used Bokashi for like manures and stuff? More of like the chicken manures, or um, just I tried rank. doing Bokashi on a bunch of different food stocks, 
and um, with with varying results, and uh, you know, just just could never get that species diversity I was looking for out of it. It it was such a low number of species. I kind of abandoned it relatively early in the process because it wasn't bringing me um, the big species diversity I need. Now, you know, I think Lactobacillus is a great organism and, um, you know, obviously doing like sprays and things like that can have a lot of benefit in growing. But as far as um, in, in the soil food web, Lactobacillus is extremely aggressive and can really kind of dominate an ecosystem. And so for what I'm trying to get, which is that species diversity, it really isn't an optimal um, ingredient in the whole thing. Uh, otherwise, though, the stuff I do use, you know, and this has been an interesting thing is like landing in this middle ground between a super soil and a living soil. And so when I say living organic super soil, a bunch of people, you see them jump up, they're ready to fight right away, you know, and uh, and I think that we've found a fine line between those two worlds, because typically the super soils have so much nitrogen in them you burn out all your uh all your species diversity whereas most living soils aren't necessarily pumped for um mineral amending maximum delivery and i think there's kind of a middle ground and the way we've found that middle ground is by not over nitrogening everything um, we have enough nitrogen in our super soils our living organic super soils to get us you know, three weeks, no feed with can of stuff, and you won't see a deficiency till five weeks, but it'll only be nitrogen deficiency. And so then the grower has their kind of place to play with, you know, a soy-based amino or a feather meal or a blood meal or whatever kind of nitrogen they like, um, as long as it's not a nitrate, they're, they're going to have that balance in that room to deliver it afterwards. But if we put all the nitrogen in we need to grow a cannabis crop from beginning to end, it's uh, it's going to kill kill all that biology, and so that's kind of kind of why I'm not as into the full on no amending super soils, and it's how we've kind of been able to create this kind of category defying pro uh, product that is both sort of a super soil and a living organic soil, and so you know then all of the other ingredients the fish bone meal, the fossilized seabird guano, um, all of those are in certain ratios. And we just kept adding till we got them in ratio and kept looking at the scope. And when we would start seeing significant populations drop off, oh, well, we, uh, we definitely know that, uh, that that's not what we want. And so then we draw that ingredient back. And it's a place where, you know, um, over over the years, we've been able to find this mix of over 20 different ingredients that deliver all of the minerals we want in the right ratios over time. And it's where like people, there are a lot of folks right now just pushing single amendment sulfates and just say, oh, well, you just, it's too complicated. You just can't use all these natural ingredients. You got to go back to the salts. And yeah, they're sulfates. So they're kind of in that gray area between a salt and a, a, uh, an organic, but I feel like in a way they're kind of cheating themselves from being able to work with nature and use a highly diverse complex base that is a lot more like the rainforest floor than just using sulfates as kind of halfway salts, you know, and, and they are salts to, uh, to deliver those minerals. Is it, is it easier? Is it a, a special kind of like trick to make it easy? Sure, sulfates are. Nonetheless, I do think you're kind of selling yourself short by not working with all of the biology that nature offers us on the rainforest floor. Agreed 100%, brother. And the, you know, it, it does seem with time, and again, these are you know just a few years of my me seeing this kind of stuff. That once that stuff is dialed in uh, and getting closer to almost water only or a few amendments and water only, it just gives you your life back 
but you're also growing high end, whatever you decide to grow, a nutrient dense foods. Um, and that just, I think, continues down the line on the flip side of things, man. When I started to actually pay attention to what I was eating, I feel like my nutrient levels went up. I started to feel better. And I've always noticed that with my plants. And I've always been maybe too busy to really implement that in my life. And that's what I, I like about you, Bart, man, is you live and breathe this stuff. So I uh, just appreciate you, uh, you know, giving your time today. Yeah, well, thank you, Brian. And it it is all very important. And um, healthy, fully mineralized foods are super important. And it's interesting that that gets us back to what Albrecht discovered is that the livestock could taste the difference in the grass from in the pasture and out of the pasture. And he wanted to know why, why does the, the grass greener on the other side of the fence? And he went and discovered that actually it's because the minerals are different. They're not depleted. And that's what we got to remember. The same tomato in the store can have wildly varying different um, amounts of nutrients. And it's what cannabis has kind of taught me because it's a pinnacle feeder. If you take that same, same soil that can only feed cannabis for three to five weeks without a deficiency, you can feed a garden on that same soil for over a year um, because you don't have that massive nitrogen consumption that really hungry and can cannabis survive with less sure but when you're trying to really grow it to its full potential it can eat and we all know it can eat and that's why i've kind of focused in the end down on leaving nitrogen and phosphorus the two elements that i let the grower in the end tune to their strain or their crop and that's in that way with the least amount of effort they can still have the full control over the growth of the plant and uh and albrick kind of showed in the end why the plant is better and and even the pig farmers now you'll see them the second their pig starts rooting really hard they know okay my pigs are missing trace minerals and they're they're needing more vitamins um so yeah just what you were saying it really makes a huge difference in our overall health and um, this biology this mineralization is probably the biggest thing i think we can do to be healthy and um, succeed as a species in the future. So, yeah, thanks for having me today. Yeah, I love the way you uh, you, you you provide the the foundation um, for the grower, but let them adjust accordingly. And you know, one of the things is that I don't think was brought up, but blood is fast release and feather meal is slow release. So, there's no reason why you can't anticipate. As a, as a competent grower, what you think your needs are going to be after a certain period of time and then apply correctly. And if, if, your, feather, if your feather meal is in place, but you're not getting the bump that you need, that's when you throw more microbes at it. You know, you make a nice compost extract and apply that and that feather meal will begin to disintegrate very quickly and then release to the plant. So, you know, big ups part for you and, and the work that you've done and, and the fact that you're so willing to share all of this uh, what I want to call very insightful information to the audience. Uh, you know, again, big ups, brother, big ups. Thank you, Layton. You as well. And you too, Brian, and you too, Peter. Um, that's what makes this show great is that we all um, have done a lot of work and we're all in the spirit of trying to help everyone be successful with us. So, yep, great crew and great show and always, always love coming on here and making people mad. <laughs> <laughs> what's up peter just multitasking uh no i mean s some of the stuff you guys were talking about earlier um you know it's like you watch this channel for a week straight for a week straight and you'll be like yesterday i heard someone say the exact opposite thing is what i'm hearing today and uh, so as Bart said, uh, definitely be open, listen, but also do your own due diligence, your own research on your own research on everything you hear uh, here. Is, is Peter like uh, Tony two times today for everybody else? You mean, Ma you mean Max Headroom? <laughs> so, uh, am I glitching I gotta get out? the papers, the papers. That's it. <laughs> Full Max Headroom. Leighton and I are the only old guys that remember that shit. I remember Max Hedrum. Okay. I remember Max Hedrum. All right. Yeah, just yeah. Yeah. Hey. 
<laughs> it repeated it back to back, Peter. Okay, hold on. Right when you let said me it. let me switch computers. Hold on. I love it. <laughs> hey, so what do you think about like different forms of calcium, Bart? Like I, I'm experimenting with like uh, oyster shell flour, all those things from plants, limestone. Uh, but then I started messing around with coral calcium a little bit. And it seems like because I am messing with crustaceans, boom, they are drawn to that a little bit more than maybe other sources. That's fascinating. Yeah, I haven't played with coral calcium. I think it's really interesting. I've played around. There's a there's a whole side of calcium where, um, you know, you get into bicarbonates and stuff like this. And then the opinions really get crazy. You know, there's some people who think that bicarbonates are like the worst thing you could ever have in your soil. But then you look at, okay, what about, um, you know, calcium carbonate that has been biologically processed through a composting process, and now you've got something completely different. And so, um, you know, obviously calcium silicates, I think, are great. Oyster shell flour is really awesome in that way. It also has a lot of carbonate in it. Um, you know, there's that Vansil stuff. I've seen some pretty interesting results with that. It's technically Omri, but it comes from a uh, uh, it comes from an industrial byproduct. Um, so I like calcium silicate. I like calcium carbonate. I just feel like with a lot of it, it is fairly important to pre-digest that through a compost process if you want to get it. Uh, available to the plants, you know, and then of course you've got um, gypsum, calcium sulfate, which is a salt and we use it. And of all the salts, I really feel like calcium sulfate is probably one of the best and least harmful. Um, in our clay soil out here, nothing has ever performed as well as gypsum. And it's really weird because we have a ton of calcium in the soil here, but it's all locked up in um, alkalinity. And so without an acid to deliver it, you really don't get this bioavailability. And so a little bit of gypsum here and there goes a long way. I think it needs to be used judiciously, but um, I think it, it provides a really valuable source when you need to deliver uh, some natural calcium quickly. I think gypsum is your friend. So, um, you know, once again, just like everything, I, I don't get any one uh, nutrient from a specific source i try to have two or three or four sources of this nutrient and in a different form and in a different fashion and in that way it's it's a little bit you know i can't ask a bacteria what it wants to eat um so we have to kind of take a guess then we can do a science and see if they do better uh and then if in the end it gets to the plant and does better but a lot of it really is guess and test. You know, you have to you have to take a guess. And the rain, you know, a lot of people want a simpler mix, but the rainforest floor is not simple. Its composition is going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of different um, compounds that came to be in different ways, made out of tens or twenties or thirties of elements, um, and and they are so complex, like, especially even just into the proteins world, you know, so many different proteins, so many ways to get there, so many amino acids um, that, yeah, it uh, calcium is extremely important, needs to be in ratio. I aim for a five to one or six to one calcium to magnesium ratio. Um, yep, I think calcium is important, but I think you can do a lot by pre-processing calcium through the composting process. And Brian, I got a couple of two cents to throw at that um, that coral base. So again, you're you're dealing with enzymatic processes underwater, and so you're obviously getting some earth rare earth minerals uh, and nutrients that you would not get on a, a terrestrial form of calcium. I mean, that's why oyster shell meal has always been so popular amongst the growers because you're getting you're getting other things involved, like just what Bar just said. He's like don't use one source, use three, four sources. And, and again, each one of them is going to provide um, a different release time as well as other components that you're not going to get in just one source. Diversity, diversity. So yeah, keep us posted on that. 
Well, uh, one last question for you, Layton. Um, so, like, with the size of the bark, um, it, it sometimes is like the size may, maybe a little bit smaller, like of the oyster shell itself, the actual shell. Do you think adding that and, and kind of using it as a, just another form of quote unquote bark, do you think uh, the crustaceans, the springtails, the rogue beetles, all of them would appreciate just a, another place to hide out, maybe reproduce and uh, break down? Uh, the, obviously, it would take a while, but begin to break that down. Can you say avocado or shell tech? All right. So there is absolutely there's a lot to just continue to play with this kind of stuff and see where this stuff kind of takes. Yeah, if you, if you took an oyster shell and turned it upside down, you would create a micro environment inside the dome of that shell. And that is going to be unique to uh, every other part of your, your environment that you're growing them out in. So you're going to have probably higher level of humidity. You're going to have condensation that's occurring during the heating and cooling phases of day and night. So, yeah, I mean, again, that's probably one of the reasons why avocado tech became such a big hit because it created that microclimate or environment for the uh, and providing the nutrients for the for the worms to go crazy and in, in breeding and, uh, you know, multiplying. So I would definitely, I would definitely try it. And and don't again limit yourself to just oyster shells. Try clam shells. Try mussel shells. As many different types of shells as you can get. Again, they're they're a form of calcium that will slowly break down as uh, as the microbes consume them. Um, and it's again, it's not going to do any harm. And at, at the same time, creating that microenvironment for those insects. And those insects, you know, they they're looking for you know dark, humid place to have their fun <laughs> i've been playing around with uh pistachio shells kind of on the same vision of like avocado tech uh, and i think there's uh, also something to pistachio tech the shell aspect of it uh, they they seem to also love to hide in there and break things down so you know it's funny you should say that brian because uh, way back when i used to add a lot of pistachio cells uh, shells to my um well, they're, they're hybrid Hugel, uh, biocomplete compost pile. Um, and what I would notice is when I went to harvest the compost and screen it, I'd get the shells and they didn't break down very much, but you would get like these little like shell filled with water. And in that water, when you microscoped it, crazy diverse flagellates and, and other bacteria. So again, I'm creating these little pockets of microclimates that are conducive to growing out things that I wouldn't ordinarily get unless I had added them in. So yeah, I think, I think what you're doing is, is again, creating all these other little microclimates for, for the magic to happen. Exactly. And I'd like to uh, take a second. Somebody was asking if we're still available in OKC. We are. Um, our resellers up there decided not to pay their bills on a couple trucks, so they're gone. But our buddy Nick Brockmeyer, the CBDJ, has us at the oil room in OKC right now. Uh, he's a homie who saw that that uh, our folks we, we worked with there before did us wrong, and he's taken over. And so um, he's a great guy to go to, plus a great place with a uh, fun, fun place and good culture. So go check out the oil room in OKC. It's on MacArthur Boulevard, and uh, he has our products at a great price in OKC. So thanks for asking. Sorry to hear about your struggles, dude. People suck. Yeah, I don't know. It's a weird one. You'd think when it's going well, people would just want to pay for their stuff and keep moving forward. But uh, some of these folks think that they can just drop you and pick up the next guy and and then they learn oh maybe the next guy isn't what i had before so yeah it's interesting to watch but uh, but yep it's part of the part of the game i learned that when i was really young uh bartending when i would like listen to these gentlemen talk about their issues from the day or whatever and some of these gentlemen would talk the, the one one story that stuck out real quick was the gentleman that was having a rough day i was kind of talking to him or whatever and he, i guess he built a building in miami and started to to lean just a little bit and so like he, he basically his view was everybody under the sun was suing him 
So he was about to potentially lose everything that he'd ever built for, built built with. And, um, you know, he was, he was extremely well-off individual, but just because the building tilted a little bit and his name is on that, uh, they were going after everything, at least business-wise, that he had. Well, you know what? I, as a contractor of many years, shame on him. He took the cheapest fucking price. And so obviously they yeah. didn't take the time to really make sure that they had pounded the piers down to to solid ground when they started building and and fucking florida is a goddamn you know shale or not shale uh, uh coral mine it's it's loaded with with caves and and you know the soil is not suitable for for high rises i mean look what happened in uh that building collapse you know everything just sank and cracked and they didn't do the maintenance and you know i, I have a similar story except for a little bit different in the in the essence that you know, I would I would be working with these extremely wealthy people and they'd be bragging how they fucked everybody, just like what Bart went through. It was like, oh, yeah, you know, you, you lead them on, you lead them on, you lead them on, you, you get them to do more and more work and you don't pay them and you promise them all on the next job, I'll catch up with you. And then you file chapter and you reorganize and come up as a new entity a month later and you have no responsibles, responsibility to pay those bills. I, I've witnessed that through I don't know how many economic groups. And yep. you know that's the frustration with humanity is they get so fucking egotistical and confident in themselves that they think that they can just stomp on the little guy um, and steal their money. So you know, I, fucking humanity. That's why I, I guess that the point of that story I was trying to get at uh, was that um, it, there's a point, to, at least to me, especially with farming and just business, where I, I like to kind of stay in the smaller microbial world of business. Uh, because the risk just seems so great. And, and listening to all those gentlemen get drunk and tell me their war stories in business, uh, it sounds ruthless at that level when you're talking millions of dollars. Or This gentleman was probably talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and just the look, the, like the sickness just in his face and everything. Like I would, I don't know how I would handle that kind of thing. And um, Bart, I know that you, you deal with pretty big numbers, man. So I, I guess I was just kind of, <laughs> bringing that up man to to say that it just seems like bullshit especially when you're at the large commercial level of what people will do in the legal business sense uh, because in the other world uh, they would never do that kind of stuff because it would get around and individuals would um, take care of it as they they saw fit um, and that that was the part that made everything always continue to move in that world is that people just didn't want to be shamed because there's no way to make money that way if everybody was like yo fuck that guy yeah, exactly. No, that's it. And, uh, you know, it's interesting how it goes. And it's really been a, a key part of our business. Like, while we have had a lot of success and we've grown a lot in the nine years we've been doing this, we have specifically not worked with the big box stores. You can't get our soil at Home Depot. You can't get it at Walmart. You can't get it uh, through Hawthorne. Um, you know, Hawthorne's asked us several times to to come on board with them and i just don't feel like it's part and parcel with our mission of getting the soil to the people with the best prices i love to support the little mom and pop grow store in your town um, i feel like these businesses are ones that we have a great relationship and in that way i have been very lucky that most of the people who sell our soil are my friends um, when i come to town we hang out you know like you and i do or whatever and uh and it's real people providing a real need in the community and more and more as things go online i feel like having those stores locally with expertise with the stuff you need um is really important and uh and the giant conglomerates aren't serving the needs of the people in general they're serving their bottom line so it kind of makes sense and uh and in a strange kind of way i you know when i started i didn't know if this philosophy would work, but it was what I believed. So we, uh, we uh, uh, have really tried to support the local store and it's great when it works. Occasionally they decide they're going to try and do something different and, uh, and it doesn't. And so be it, we'll part ways and, and uh, I'll do what I can to get paid. But nonetheless, it's on down the road. And when I've got a guy like the CBDJ there in OKC who says, yeah, buddy, you know, bring it over here, then 
he's going to get that business, not those guys. So it, uh, it all works out like an organic system, but I agree, Brian, it, it, it is interesting how all that plays out and you get to really learn what people are the kind of people you like hanging out with and what kind are the kind that would cut their own throat to make an extra buck. Yeah, sadly, the majority of the industry. Um, but hey, man, that's why I think starting off small and then being being able to control things is where you're at uh, for whatever business you're after. Uh, that's why I was kind of getting at it. Like, if you have these huge dreams, it's pretty hard to achieve them uh, without other individuals working with you. And most of the time when it's on a large conglomerate, most people aren't seeing eye to eye. So it just becomes really bullshit behind the scenes. Um, and I like the freedom of being a small entrepreneur, um, making decent income at the same time, uh, the freedom of just kind of enjoying and picking your day, being able to do this each week. You know, I choose to do that. Uh, I like that kind of stuff. And no one was teaching me that back when I was younger. It was like you go to college and then hopefully you get picked up by some kind of larger business and then you work there and uh, for 20, 25 years, 30 years, whatever it was. Uh, and that's just not the way the world works. I mean, you're not, you know, my, I feel like my family, the reason why we struggled is because uh, they didn't understand that aspect of life is that you're going to be able to, to self-preserve a lot easier if you're the one out there creating the jobs for yourself. There you go. Yeah. For sure. For sure. And that's why we need more like men, especially male mentors on that kind of thing is because of, if people don't really show you the way on that, it does seem like the only way uh, to get rich is to take from others or slight from others or something, because it, it never seems like there is enough. You're always going hungry. You know, you see all these people live in a certain way that you want to live. And it creates, you know, especially in Atlanta at that time, it created a lot of jealousy for a lot of individuals. A lot of violence would come from that kind of stuff, all because nobody felt like they had enough uh, when the reality was if if there was more of like a business sense to that aspect of where I grew up. I think a lot more people would have eaten like in the microbial world, you know, if everybody would have had their little aspects, but that's not how it worked. Everybody tried to take from one another. And that is a fairly natural reaction to like having scarcity and nothing fear takes over. And, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that that's what happens, but, as human beings, we have the ability to rise above that and to think about these things, not just react. And so that I think is the most important thing is to teach our kids and raise kids that are thinkers, not just reactors. And if you don't have a parent to do that for you, then what's your choice, but to react to the stimuli. So, you know, there's no blame in it, but I do think like you're saying, there's a better way. And it's important for us to know that and teach our kids these things and um, we can do a lot better working together than we can fighting each other and teaching each other here on platforms like this, you know, giving, giving the confidence to other people <clears throat> through our experiences and education is, is mentoring in so many ways. And, you know, so again, thank you for taking your time and coming on and Brian, you, I mean, you've, you've been doing this for well, almost two years now, right? Or what is it? 18? Just as long as you brother. <laughs> good, good point. <laughs> Actually, I've been doing it for a few years earlier, but <laughs> uh, no, to be fair. Yeah, I was well, I was doing like little conferences and small little rooms and stuff. But yeah, to be at this point and just to get the gold nuggets of, hey, now I'm going to start using the, the calcium sh shells, basically, like, you know, of the sea, find a diversity there, play around with that kind of stuff. That's also why I think, you know, for whatever reason, when you when you're constantly giving, you get these little things that just pop up out of nowhere, man. And it sounds such it it sounds like bullshit. You know, it sounds like, oh, this dude popped up into my life. I met him here. I met him there like that. That shit really does exist. And um, I'm just, I guess, going to uh, put my tinfoil hat on for that aspect of life is because I'm I'm living and breathing it, man. And Bart, you're you know, there's a reason why you've been on the show multiple times. Late and I don't necessarily like to do that because we do like to get a variety of different people on there and ways that they think and believe. I mean, that's the goal of this show. Uh, but you're always, man, when I talk to you, like I mentioned at the beginning of this, you're, you're on another level with this stuff. And then 
uh, mentally. And then to have it backed up by the size of your facility and the amount of volume that you make each and every year. Uh, I, I just appreciate your time on that because who the hell normally would, would share this kind of stuff with people they would always be too busy. Well, Brian, the good, good, good note. And, and for everybody to understand is yes, you get what you give. And that has been proven over and over again. And you know, it's, it's scary to be the one that's just giving shit away. And you're often viewed as a weak person for, for giving and not stealing or taking. But in reality, that is not a weakness. That is a sign of greatness. And that's why you get rewarded when you give. So, here, here. and, you know, let's, let's reel it back in a little bit about Bicarb. Um, and that was something that you mentioned and we really didn't talk about because, you know, Bicarb has got another chain. So it's more complex. So it has more complex interactions. It has perhaps harder to break down in certain environments. Um, you know, it's something that's very common, commonly used in aquaculture to buffer the water. Um, but what is your experience in, have you played around with any sources of bicarb in your, in your processes? Um, you know, I just see it in water, like you're saying. And so um, it mostly is a treating a symptom kind of work. Um, I do find that those bicarbonates get broken down and turned into other things with soil microbes. So it's a place where I really feel like the microbes yet again shine in um, helping change uh, materials chemically and being able to put them into a better place to deliver to the plant. And to me, that's what's so cool is that, you know, the microbes generally, at, at least in, in aerobic environments, don't create toxic substances. They always seem to make them less toxic. And, uh, and I find that like, you know, when you think about it in nature, like, let's say we have a big volcanic eruption, you're going to have a lot of heavy metals come to the surface. And so it's a similar thing, like nature's out there trying to help us detoxify from uh, those elements naturally occurring that may be toxic. And kind of in the same way, bicarbonates, um, I feel like the soil microbes are going to try to reduce those and make them more plant available and more human available. But certainly in large quantities, bicarbonates can reduce overall yields and growth. Thank you for that. That was that was that was well said. You as well. Uh, do you guys want to open up to questions? And um, if yeah. I dip, dip out a little earlier, that probably help me with my children. That's it. I probably have to go relatively soon too, but uh, yeah, let's, let's wrap it up a little early today. I definitely could use the time. It's getting crazy busy out here, but yes, uh, Peter, do we have any questions that stood out that, that uh, you could potentially pop up? I have not been paying attention to the questions. I've been doing other stuff, but I will now look into it. Uh, although if people could just repost questions, if they have them, that would also yeah. be just type in your helpful. question. My seashells bring all the boys to the yard, and the better than yours. <laughs> it's all That's about great, the man. It's all about the poop. It'll be interesting to see it break down with because pistachios don't break down that quickly, but when they do, they kind of do look like seashells in a way because there's little holes that kind of appear. Uh, man, they do, and I love pistachios, and I'm always throwing them in my front lawn, so. That's my firsthand experience on pistachio shells breaking down, which takes an amazingly long amount of time. I don't know what pistachio shells have in them. Um, there was that other guy. What was his name? He was like, uh, he's out of New Mexico, Michael Melendros. Do you guys know who he is? I'm writing his name down. It was like Soil Secrets, but he was big in composting pistachio shell or uh, yes. pecan he's shell. He's in New Mexico, right? Yeah, he's in New Mexico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's What's the his dude last name? Like, well, I think it's Michael Melendros, like Soil Secrets or something like that. I but had a conversation with him years ago. And me, yep. <laughs> I don't know why we never continued to talk because he was really an interesting cat. And yeah, he was all about those those fucking shells. There's something to that, buddy. There I is. think there's either like just really dense nutrients, and then it takes a lot while to break down. Um, here's a little fun fact for you that's that's horrifyingly scary. It takes a gallon of water to make one pistachio. 
Right. Yeah. You so, think about how many gallons of water are sitting crazy. on your shelf in your supermarket. Damn it, Leighton. I don't want to not be able to eat pistachios. <laughs> no, that's the one nut. That one in cashews. <laughs> yeah, it should taste good. Maybe, maybe that's me by the nut. <laughs> maybe that's so the I, reason. I had, I had reached out to him in 2019, but he never got back to me. Uh... Yeah, and I talked to him over the years about a bunch of things, but it was interesting. One of the things he was talking about was using the right type of humic acid to accelerate the decomposition of the pecan shells. And, uh, and he was all about like complex organic acids. And I remember he was like bent cause he was like, I invented the term soil food web. Everybody's on a lane Ingham. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> out of that. I didn't get out of it. All right. Yep. I know you want to go play. We're going to go play soon. I promise you. Are you going to play soon? No. But he did seem amazingly adept at turning pecan shells into compost. And that was for just, pistachio shells, right? Just Not, for the purest. His was pecan, I'm pretty sure. Oh, shit. Cashews aren't nuts? Uh -oh. Where, they are, where do they classify as? Lagoon? Uh, mm. A fruit, maybe? Like cashews? Like, if I get a trail mix thing... I usually eat the cashews way before I'd eat a peanut. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the bologna of the nuts to me, dude. Well, it's got all that oil in there, you know? Yeah. And See, flavor. So, um, gold nugs. What other questions have we got? Didn't uh, you got gold nugs all the time. There you go. <laughs> Spaceship style. <laughs> Say hi, honey. I know, I know. We're gonna go. Yeah, somewhere. for for thrips, I'd probably go after them more with like rather than it. beneficial mites. I'd probably go after them with your pirate bugs, your rove beetles, your um, stratiolilapsimitus, uh, Steiner nema uh, does really well against thrips. Steiner nema feltiae. I'd probably aim for something like that. And it really just depends on who you've got in your neck of the woods. If you're in Colorado and you're doing commercial scale, we can get you beneficials at a great price and quickly, but it's only once a week. We don't keep any in stock or anything like that. So, um, sea, that salt, sea salt, a wonderful amendment. Just go really low and slow on that one. Uh, to be yeah. fair, all the beneficials operate like that. Even the, the big brands, they ship out once a week. Uh, it's usually just, Tuesdays. Just quickly, uh, Valentina's wanted to say something, and she's been patiently waiting, so say it again. <laughs> Thanks, Valentina. <laughs> Short and sweet. Awesome. But she did yeah. bring me some. Some. She did bring me the her leftover popcorn. Oh, so. nice. nice. <laughs> Obviously, your family circus needs to start happening, Peter. <laughs> and he's right, well, in the corner eating popcorn. Should we all wrap it up or what? Yeah, she was a bean. <laughs> yeah, peanuts. I thought peanuts were beans too. Yeah. Wow. That makes sense. You guys know a lot of information on this. We have some. Oh, uh, what is the best? Uh, what's the hierarchy of uh, nuts to you guys? Well, I think the difference between is if it's grown on a tree or grown in the soil and peanuts are grown in the soil and I suspect cashews are as well. Um, and the rest of them are tree based nuts. So this cashews is kinda... are trees. Okay. Well, I'm wrong. <laughs> I like the, the off camera voice, the voice of, <laughs> of God, but, uh, Our technical support over so, here. So the, can you, can you touch on this? Cause you were talking before. Macadamiums. How, how... I'm all about those greens guys. I was just going to say that they are the best nut on the fucking farm. They're delicious, but how many gallons of water does it take to grow a damn macadamia? Well, they live in a, in a rainforest, right? So they're constantly getting moisture out of the, uh, out of the Pacific ocean. At least. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think Chris Trump waters like, like, a lot of the farms here in in uh in the central valley but i'll have to ask him that question there you go did, did you yeah. see that question because earlier uh, you were earlier you were... beef heart and liver from purchasing old cows never going to eat them 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say yeah. grind, grind them up if you can. Get them as small as you can. Mix it with sawdust or chips, some sort of carbon leaves. Get them really carbony. Uh, get your ratio in the balance and compost them. It's going to be smelly. Try not to get it around, you know, don't eat your lunch in the beef liver compost pile or anything like that, probably. But You know, another trick that's amazing is take them all, um, put them in water, um, and put a screen over the top and put a brick on top and hold it down so they're below the surface of the water. They'll never get smelly, and what will happen is you'll actually break them into uh, aminos very, very quickly, and then you can apply it without odor uh, right on your soil. Boom. You're still going to get some sludge that you're probably going to have to compost, but for the most part, you're going to you're going to take all of those uh, gases that, that make you nauseous um, and prevent them from happening um, through other, again, biological processes that are very, very complex. And I would probably be a little scared of the anaerobes in that process personally, but um, if you have a good bubbler in there, that would probably help it. Actually, no, you want them to go completely anaerobic. Okay. That's how you break them down. And, and dude, it doesn't smell. It's really it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, wow. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't drink it, but I wouldn't worry <laughs> if I got a little on my skin um, if I was spraying it. Yeah. Yeah. Bakashi them. Mad Hat Air Organics. It's essentially what you're doing. You're, you're pickling them. And the, what's going to end up smelling like is like a balsamic vinaigrette. Um, and that's that process of breaking shit down, um, but holding it and not releasing it as a, as a gaseous form. There's an there art form go. to Bokashi as well, though, because the guys that are trying their best but haven't really figured it out, that stuff reeks. Oh, yeah. Indeed. All right, we uh, we have any more questions? or? Okay, Paul, we're going to go in a minute. Relax. Chickens eat it. I don't Chickens know. Are they? Good question. Chickens are bearded dragons if you're indoors. Yeah, chickens will eat meat. They'll eat Chickens will eat almost anything. Chickens will eat chickens. That's the crazy thing. Um, they're pretty much just little dinosaurs and, um, you know, chickens, pigs, they, it's crazy what they'll eat. Speaking of dinosaurs, have you ever been muted. close to a water monitor? No. A Savannah uh, monitor? It was called a water monitor. It looked like a velociraptor. This dude was like, you want to hold it? And I, I politely was like. It, well, at least in my head, I was like, fuck no. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to take your face off. Yeah, I've seen some monitors in Mexico and in Florida that are just monstrous. Really this scary looking. From Thailand. And it looked my, very my, my roommate, it. so I, I had a boa constrictor in college. My roommate had a monitor. And uh, my other friend who lived across the hall had two caiman. Uh, we, we had all sorts of wacky reptiles. And... Uh, but I remember the crickets. We just had just all night, every night. It was like the chirp of crickets. And then the crickets would get out of the cage. And then they'd just be living in our room. So was that uh, your food source? And the then, well, when it was for the, mon for the boa constrictor, no. But, uh, and then it would move on to like baby, you know, it's like baby mice, regular mice, big mice, rats, uh, but all I remember is I, I I have the funny not right now but I have the if someone can remind me at some point I have a funny caiman story about uh, drunk people messing with a caiman and the consequences. Oh, yeah, exactly. That would be a good one. I also learned that water monitors can smell fear, just like a like a dog. So when it's sitting there looking at you, like should I take his face <laughs> off? Are you. <laughs> You gotta like, you gotta man up in that moment, I guess. So how Brian big is so how, cold? How big is this water monitor? Uh, I mean, it's a it's kind of a baby right now, but it'll be huge uh, when it gets there. But it was in this gentleman's living room. So and what in is fairness? Huge? It was decked out to the nines, like. So what is huge? Four feet tall? I don't. I, I would imagine those things get really big because they're, as far as I know, kind of like a Komodo dragon. Oh, geez. So they are big. Yeah. But hopefully it doesn't have the toxic you. venom. <laughs> yeah. <Right? laughs> I don't I don't think it had that, or at least they didn't tell me that, because I probably would have been like, no, thank you. Just leave it in the cage. Because yeah. they had they had snakes in there as well that were like 
I mean, I'm sure it wasn't this big, but it looked like it was 20 feet long. The thing was huge. Yeah. Everybody. Somebody's somebody's asking about core versus wood in subsoil, and that's an interesting one. Um, the interesting thing to me about core is it really takes a long time to break down. And I haven't been able to figure out exactly what it is about core, but it, it takes almost twice as long as sphagnum peat. Um, it takes longer than wood to break down, so it can have an advantage in that way. The big issue is that, you know, once COVID hit, like just the container, not the core itself, went from being like uh, 3000 to 20000 for a container. So right now, core is really expensive. I'm waiting for it to come back uh, price-wise, or at least for shipping to get better. Um, and the reason it's okay to ship core is because, whoa, yeah, is because uh, it. We're all listening. Yeah, I'm trying to, to talk and watch this lizard eat a whole pig at the same time. All right, let, let's quickly see him get it down, and then uh, we'll get to your thought. Yeah, so, sorry hey, to distract. So, Bart, Bart, hit me up on DM. I got a great resource for Coco coming out of uh, Mexico. Um, okay. it's super clean the guy's doing it uh, you know very responsibly and um, it doesn't have any salt it doesn't have any contaminants um, great yeah and he's a great guy I've, I've worked with his core for about a year and a half now I'm really happy with it very high in potassium slow release and like you said you can get it super coarse nuggets for aeration um, so a wonderful product or you can get the fines if you prefer those cool i'll uh, i'll get with you on that yeah we were going to start a our own operation in thailand i've got a buddy who has a patent on freezing coconuts and uh and right when that was all coming to be the shipping cost just went through the roof and it's crazy still in thailand they still burn all their core so that's the thing you got to remember is like even if you ship core from overseas here um you're still two-thirds carbon negative just because you're not burning it um most of the core in the world gets burned but if i could find a source that was even closer we would love that so yeah, yeah I'll, you're, uh, you're, you're really i'll get him. with you yeah okay. he's a wonderful guy um really responsible and, and he's bringing orders all the time into us uh bunch going to michigan and so yeah and he's got more more coming online too nice Awesome. Well, what do you say, you guys? We we went to three hours almost without <laughs> by accident. <laughs> there you go. I'm yeah, ready. Great. Good I'm show. Good. Thanks, gentlemen. Nice work. Thank you, Bart. Yeah, appreciate Very your much. time, Bart. Good growing. Y'all too. Cheers. And we got a uh, Hota Herb at 6 p.m. tonight. Chris Guerrero may or may not be lurking on channels too right now. I got to check, but uh, everyone have a good one and see you next week. YouTube.